As Shin and Ai's hand navigated the mountainous stairway, adorned with numerous Taurus, their journey unveiled the sacred grounds where shinobis honed their skills. Ice Hand, a spectral guide through the mist-laden realm, intimated that this hallowed ground served not only as the training domain for shinobi aspirants but also as the crucible where you and Shin would temper their skills for the impending trial. In the scarlet expanse of the Crimson Empire, Shin, a locale, found himself in uncharted territory. Ice Hand, asserted that this exclusive domain was the sanctioned realm solely designated for aspiring shinobis in training, forbidden for solo exploration under any circumstances. Observing with keen interest, you absorbed the sight of shinobi weapons expertly lodged within the sinewy trunks of the venerable trees, an exhibition of martial prowess that spoke of rigorous training and the symbiotic relationship between nature and the shinobi discipline. Ice Hand disclosed that you and Shin, in the twilight of their training, stood on the precipice of an accelerated journey. Instead of the customary teachings from conventional shinobi mentors, the duo would undergo an intensive crash course orchestrated by none other than the hands themselves. In response to the enigmatic word hands, Yu's eyes underwent a subtle metamorphosis, pupils dilating with a nuanced mix of awe and apprehension. Out of the ethereal silence, a lady's voice materialized, announcing her intent to initiate the inaugural phase of their training. In a fluid motion, she descended from a branch to grace a rock before the mesmerized duo, a spectral figure that met the astonished gazes of Yu and Shin. The ethereal being with verdant eyes and hair spun from moonlight revealed herself as their teacher for meditation, captivating Yu and Shin with her presence. In an abrupt revelation, Shin recognized the mysterious presence as none other than Earth Hand. Yu, caught in a mesmerized pause, hesitated in extending a greeting. Ice Hand, in his role as narrator, introduced Earth Hand as Mizuki, a master of focus. Mizuki, exuding an air of enthusiasm, declared that their journey into focus would be an enjoyable endeavor, urging them all to strive for excellence. In response, you turned to Shin, questioning the strength of Earth Hand compared to his brother. However, Shin, embodying a sense of propriety, implored you to extend due respect. Mizuki ushered the boys into her realm with a tender gesture, arms encircling them in a cloak of guidance. As they departed, Ice Hand observed with a knowing gaze, anticipating that Mizuki's training would be a difficult, one that would make them regret in the wake of its challenges. Beneath the canopy of a majestic waterfall, Yu and Shin found repose, settling down for their initiation into the realm of meditation. Mizuki, their guide in this tranquil odyssey, unveiled the purpose behind meditation. It is a conduit for the body to gather Tenchi, the ethereal life force. Puzzled, Yu, unfamiliar with the concept, sought clarification, prompting Mizuki to unravel the mysteries of Tenchi with patient elucidation. As the mentor in the art of Tenchi, Mizuki imparted wisdom to Yu, revealing that Tenchi was the aggregation of electromagnetic energy emanating from living beings, an achievable feat in theory for anyone. She delved deeper, explaining the inherent difficulty in accumulating Tenchi, emphasizing the imperative need for detachment from distractions. Mizuki drew parallels with the contemporary era, highlighting the challenges posed by short attention spans, exacerbated by the pervasive consumption of short-form content like YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels. This societal shift, she posited, was one of the reasons behind the Crimson Star Empire's deliberate seclusion from the external world. To hasten the gathering and utilization of Tenchi, Sensei Mizuki emphasized the paramount importance of deep concentration. She pointed out the symbiotic relationship between meditation and nature, where energy-rich environments such as oceans and forests catalyze the process. With a grasp of the theories, Shin posed a question about the trajectory of the gathered Tenchi. Mizuki, in her role as the wise guide, explained that the Tenchi, originating from the core of the body, diffused throughout the seven vital points. In a moment of inquiry, you sought clarity, demanding to know when he would discern whether he was successfully gathering Tenchi or not. Mizuki, adorned with a radiant smile, responded with assurance, affirming that the certainty of Tenchi accumulation would reveal itself in due course. In an abrupt tonal shift, Mizuki, the mentor steeped in wisdom, unveiled a profound truth. A practitioner mastering meditation and ascending to the zenith of focus could harness Tenchi with unparalleled speed, a formidable asset in battle. This revelation prompted you to question the difference. Was meditation intended for peace, while focus was harnessed for battle? Mizuki, never having pondered this perspective, 
concurred, acknowledging it as one plausible interpretation. Choosing practicality over a discourse on theories, Mizuki suggested a demonstration. Approaching a colossal rock, she revealed that the previous day, 30 shinobi trainees had collectively unleashed their skills upon it, leaving only superficial scratches. Shin and Yu, their attention fixed on the impending display, astutely noted that the students' efforts had evidently fallen short. With a pragmatic acknowledgement, Mizuki noted the expected outcome of the student's test failure. Transitioning into a state of intense focus, a potent aura emanated from her being. With a swift and forceful strike, she delivered a punch to the massive boulder, leaving behind a colossal crater. Shin and Yu, witnessing the spectacle from behind, were utterly astounded, their minds blown by the display. Unyielding in her demonstration, Mizuki elevated the spectacle. Executing a mighty leap onto the rock, she utilized its surface to spring in the opposite direction. Retrieving two shurikens, she deftly positioned them on her hand, ready for release. In a seamless motion mid-air, she hurled the shurikens, each hurtling toward Yu and Shin. The duo, gripped by fear, could only watch in trepidation as the deadly projectiles closed in. Remaining suspended in the air, Mizuki adorned her countenance with a graceful smile after releasing the shurikens toward the defenseless boys. Then, with lightning pace, she seemingly vanished from her previous position, reappearing right before the boys. In a dazzling display of skill, she deftly deflected both shurikens with her katana. Yu, caught off guard, struggled to comprehend the surreal spectacle unfolding before him. With a graceful resheathing of her katana, Mizuki's countenance softened in remorse as she extended an apology to the boys for the shock they endured. True to expectations, the boys found themselves in a state of speechlessness. It was in this aftermath that Shin, enlightened, realized the potential to gather Tenchi while on the move, breaking free from the conventional notion of static meditation. Mizuki continued her discourse, revealing that this art was specifically honed to combat demons, malevolent entities that fed on human energy to enhance their own potency. Altering her expression once more, she assumed a serious tone, delving into the ominous reality that higher-ranked demons wielded access to the negative realm, empowering them to execute cruel deeds. Beads of sweat formed on the brows of both boys as Mizuki's words cast a shadow over the atmosphere. Suddenly, Mizuki's demeanor transformed back to that of the affable and caring teacher she had been before, the brief interlude of an unladylike expression now a distant memory. The boys, momentarily bewildered, were once again enveloped in the warmth of her kind presence. In a serene tone, Mizuki calmly instructed the boys to disrobe, as if it were an everyday ritual. Confounded, Shin sought clarification, questioning Mizuki sensei once again. A sudden realization dawned upon them. They had not misunderstood, and both their faces flushed with embarrassment. Yu, puzzled, queried Mizuki about the need for undressing, to which she responded that it was to prepare for getting wet. Beneath the serene surface of the water, graceful koi fish glided, their vibrant colors dancing in harmony with the liquid canvas. Yu and Shin, as anticipated, stood unclothed beside a majestic, isolated waterfall. The cascade, a spectacle of nature's grandeur, provided a secluded backdrop to their unusual lesson. Beneath the relentless cascade of the waterfall, Yu and Shin sat, their forms subdued by the chilling waters. Shivers coursed through them as the cold deluge persisted. Mizuki, observing from a distance while sipping a steaming cup of tea, queried the boys about their endurance in the face of the icy challenge. Immersed in discomfort, the boys could only offer silent stares, rendered speechless by the chilling ordeal. Mizuki responded with a warm and radiant smile, interpreting their muted response as a testament to the numbing cold that enveloped them entirely. With a composed motion, Mizuki set her cup of tea aside and gracefully traversed all the stepping stones, reaching the final one with ease. Surveying the two boys, she deemed it time to conclude the session, recognizing that two hours beneath the unforgiving waterfall had run its course. With evident delight, you prepared to disengage from the chilling waters. However, Shin, driven by determination, opted to linger a while longer. He informed you of his decision to catch up later, despite Yu's reminder that Earth Hand had already dismissed them. Shin, feeling a sense of urgency to bridge the gap with his peers, asserted that doubling his efforts was necessary to close the distance. In the depths of contemplation, you grasped the significance of Shin's words, realizing that he, too, lagged behind. In a decisive moment, you chose solidarity, opting to join Shin and endure the relentless waterfall.
Motivating both of them, he shouted that enduring longer would yield strength, a mantra of, no pain, no gain. Initially skeptical about the possibility of the two boys catching up to their counterparts, Mizuki's belief wavered. Yet, witnessing their determination to endure beneath the waterfall, a glimmer of hope emerged within her. Curiosity prompting him, you questioned the sensei about the benefits of enduring the ceaseless waterfall. Earth Hand, as she strolled away, informed you that the answer typically unraveled over a span of six months. The notion of being beneath the ice-cold water for half a year incited a flare of frustration within you. Several hours later, the boys, now clad in blankets, found themselves battling the onset of a cold, the aftermath of their prolonged exposure beneath the waterfall. Despite being away from the waterfall, you continued to sneeze and shiver, expressing doubt about enduring the same ordeal again the next day. In response, Shin, his own nose running, questioned Yu's commitment to becoming a shinobi, sparking a playful yet competitive fight between the two. The challenge was set, to determine who could endure the waterfall the longest. With both of them battling a runny nose, you took a moment to explore Shin's house, offering compliments on its welcoming atmosphere. However, he couldn't help but be taken aback by the sheer volume of books adorning Shin's room. Shin, recognizing his weakness in physical strength, compensated by integrating technology into his fighting style. Yu acknowledges Shin's use of technology as they reminisced about a time when Shin used his phone to disrupt a demon. Yu, suddenly curious, inquired about the whereabouts of Shin's brother and parents. With a tinge of sadness, Shin revealed that his brother returned only once or twice a month, with Ice Hand preoccupied by missions ever since their parents fell victim to demons. Yu, offering condolences for Shin's loss, shared his own experience of losing his mother, drawing a connection between their shared destinies. Cautiously, Shin requested more details about Yu's mother and the incident. As Yu gazed skyward, he pondered how to embark on the emotional journey of narrating the events. As the two boys continued to forge a connection through shared experiences, Ice Hand remained a silent observer on the roof. His presence was marked by stillness, devoid of actions or words. Quietly stationed, he lingered on the roof for a moment before effortlessly bouncing to another location. On the following day, beneath the grace of the elegant waterfall, the two boys assumed a meditative posture as they silently endured its cascading embrace. Mizuki, observing their serene meditation, questioned the efficacy of their practice under the relentless waterfall. Yu, the first to respond, expressed his dissatisfaction, questioning the efficacy of sitting under the waterfall in achieving what Earth Hand could do. Mizuki, in response, clarified that the goal wasn't to emulate her abilities but to swiftly gather Tenchi even in challenging circumstances. Both boys listened attentively as the water continued its relentless descent. Expanding on her explanation, Mizuki asserted that if they could gather Tenchi in the cold and amidst the thunderous noise of the crashing water, they would acquire the ability to concentrate anywhere. Shin, grasping Mizuki's point, questioned if the exercise was merely for building comfort. In frustration, you questioned when he would know if he was ready for the next test, having devoted over two days to the exercise without feeling the elusive Tenchi. Frustrated, you placed blame on the teacher, asserting that he hadn't learned anything from her. In response, Mizuki concurred, stating that Tenchi couldn't be learned from someone else. She could only guide them. She offered a radiant smile, emphasizing that they held the key to unlocking their own potential. Out of the blue, the red-haired warrior stumbled upon Earth Hand and the two boys. For those unfamiliar with him, details are provided in the last episode's description. Casting a glance from afar, he questioned the nature of Earth Hand's interaction with the boys, contemplating if they were fresh recruits. Offering a valuable tip to the two boys, Earth Hand instructed them to empty their minds and cease talking, urging them to envision the water's non-existence. In response, you couldn't help but blurt out that she should have shared this advice earlier. Realizing his inadvertent honesty, he swiftly covered his mouth in disbelief at what he had disclosed to his teacher. Fixing a stern gaze directly into Yu's eyes, Earth Hand revealed that she had been entrusted by Ice Hand to supervise the training, asserting that quitting was not an option unless they faced death. Detecting the building tension, Shin discreetly gestured to Yu, advising him to keep his mouth shut, recognizing that speaking only aggravated Earth Hand. In accord with Shin's silent guidance, Yu closed his mouth, acknowledging the need for caution. In the serene atmosphere of Shin's home, where birds traverse the skies against the backdrop of a setting sun, 
the two boys endure persistent shivers each day following their demanding training. As time unfolded, the once daunting task gradually became more manageable for the boys. They found themselves running around and playing in the water, almost oblivious to the initial chilling discomfort. However, when the day comes to an end and they return to the inviting warmth of their home, the boys wrap themselves in blankets, seeking refuge from the enduring chill. Persistently, you marks off each passing day on the calendar, tracking the duration of their training under the waterfall. With a runny nose, he gazes at the marked calendar, questioning the true extent of his progress. In this iteration, as Shin persists in his seated meditation beneath the cascading waterfall, you opts for a change of pace by standing. Mizuki, carefully observing them from a distance, suddenly finds Ice Hand appearing behind her, inquiring about the progress of their training. Mizuki takes a moment to elucidate to Ice Hand that Shin's unwavering determination to become a shinobi drives him to strictly adhere to the rules. Conversely, Yu showcases a mischievous side, but within him resides a reminiscent essence of someone truly special. In the confines of their home, rather than shivering beneath coiled blankets, the boys chose to engage in push-ups. Yu, accustomed to this daily routine, effortlessly completes numerous repetitions, while Shin, unaccustomed to such exercises, grapples with the challenge. In their leisure moments, the boys rendezvous with Yakomi, a friend of Shin's. Despite the rigorous training under the waterfall, the duo persists, occasionally punctuating their regimen with much-needed breaks to care for their weary bodies. In the progression of days, Yu faithfully continues his ritual of crossing off each day, signifying the duration of his training. Despite his persistence, he grapples with the belief that his body isn't attaining the elusive tenchi. Self-doubt creeps in as he questions whether he might be making a misstep. Shin, inclined towards theory, consults the shinobi manual and elucidates that the current situation is entirely normal, a phase every shinobi undergoes. Yu, impatient with the meditation process, expresses a desire to learn combat techniques against demons. In response, Shin asserts that Yu's yearning for vengeance blinds him, quoting the guidebook that advocates patience and endurance as the keys to overcoming this stage. Fixing his gaze on Yu, Shin imparts a motivating assurance that they will overcome the challenges together, urging Yu to instill faith in himself and Earth Hand. Grateful for Shin's encouragement, Yu openly acknowledges the uplifting impact. Subsequently, both boys ready themselves for bed, knowing another day of training awaits them. Yu, fueled by determination, boldly declares his intent to be the first to gather Tenchi, eager to outpace Shin in the race. As the next day unfolds, both boys find themselves once again beneath the unyielding waterfall. Engrossed in his customary concentration, Shin's focus is abruptly disrupted by a peculiar sensation. Hastily, he opens his eyes, perplexed, and raises his hands to feel the water, grappling to comprehend the unfolding anomaly. With a sudden realization, Shin shoots upright, proclaiming that the water no longer carries its previous chill. In fact, to him, the water now feels almost warm. Meanwhile, Yu, beneath the waterfall and wearing a puzzled expression, contends that the water still retains its frigid touch. Curiosity driving him, Shin questions whether Earth Hand manipulated the water. She dismisses the idea, clarifying that the transformation occurred internally. With a sense of accomplishment, she extends congratulations to Shin, affirming that the altered sensation signifies the successful gathering of Tenchi within the body. The unexpected revelation leaves both Shin and Yu visibly shocked. Yu, seeking clarity, turns to Shin for an explanation of his experience. Shin, still uncertain himself, offers a vague response, conveying that something within him has indeed changed. Observing this exchange, Yu scratches his head, realizing that he has lost the bet he made with Shin, where he confidently asserted he would be the first to successfully gather Tenchi among them. Then Shin takes a look around him and asks Yu to examine the droplets of water hovering around him. Inquisitively, Yu begins to touch the suspended drops of water that appear to float around Shin. Earth Hand then instructs Shin to grasp onto the present sensations and thoughts. Eagerly, Yu demands Shin to showcase something impressive, perhaps a powerful punch or an extraordinary jump. Shin, donning a smile on his face, brimming with excitement from this newfound sensation, agrees to fulfill Yu's request. With determination, Shin clenches his fingers into a tight fist, withdraws his arms, and delivers a forceful punch to the ground. Astonishingly, his punch generates a fracture on the surface, causing stone fragments to scatter in every direction. 
Following this impressive display, he executes a powerful leap, directing a kick towards a nearby stone. Instantaneously, the top portion of the stone shatters under the impact. Bouncing lightly on his feet, Shin jubilantly exclaims that he senses an invincible power surging within him. Mesmerized by this spectacle, Yu comprehends that a heightened focus can indeed bestow superhuman abilities. However, Shin begins to sense a gradual depletion of his tenchi, a realization that tempers the elation of his newfound capabilities. Anticipating the gradual depletion of his tenchi, Shin decides to test his jumping ability before it wanes. Adopting a wide stance to maximize his ascent, he propels himself into the air, achieving an astonishing height. Amidst the continuous cascade of water, he continues to ascend, defying gravity. Yu, astonished by the evident disparity in power with and without Tenchi, stands stupefied at the spectacle. Observing from a distance, Mizuki radiates a beaming smile as one of them finally achieves the desired feat. However, as Shin soars upward, he inadvertently collides with a rock overhead, abruptly descending and crashing onto his back. In immediate concern, Yu urgently questions Shin's well-being. Holding his head, Shin reassures you that he's okay but admits that the stunt did leave him in pain. Yet, upon contemplation, Shin acknowledges that the impact from that height should have resulted in more pain and potential bleeding. Surprisingly, there's no evidence of injury, highlighting the role of Tenchi in fortifying the body's resistance. Yu, thrilled by this revelation, envisions Shin's newfound ability to leap over buildings. Shin concurs, acknowledging the expanded possibilities. Earth Hand gracefully enters the scene, acknowledging the boy's enthusiasm while cautioning against recklessness. She gracefully concludes their training for the day with a firm but gentle tone. Shin, bubbling with excitement after successfully gathering Tenchi, eagerly steps out of the waterfall, eager to share his accomplishment with Yukomi. As Yu stands under the cascading waterfall, his contemplative gaze shifts inward, questioning the elusive nature of the Tenchi. He grapples with the essence of meditation, attempting to decipher the code that has proven elusive to him. Amidst the rhythmic symphony of falling water, Yu delves into a profound self-inquiry. His eyes trace the patterns of liquid threads, seeking answers within the intricacies of his own consciousness. The waterfall, once a mere backdrop, transforms into a metaphorical mirror reflecting the depths of his internal struggle. Yu stood solitary beneath the cascading veil of the waterfall, a realm of solitude now that Shin, having attained mastery over the art of channeling Tenchi within, had departed. Amidst the relentless deluge, Yu's internal mantra echoed persistently, urging him to center his focus even as the frigid rivulets continued their unwavering descent. Abruptly, a substantial stone hurtled through the expanse, narrowly missing Yu as it traversed the air. The enormity of the rock disrupted Yu's concentration, the very essence of his focus wavering in the wake of this colossal projectile. The subsequent collision with a tree resonated with a thunderous report, the impact echoing through the surroundings. In the aftermath, Yu, now collected, addresses Shin, emphasizing the gravity of the near-fatal encounter with the airborne stone. Shin, in a display of mockery, offers a sarcastic apology. With a sly glimmer in his eyes, Shin playfully taunts Yu, encouraging him to hasten the collection of Tenchi for their collaborative training sessions. However, irritation taints Yu's retort, cautioning Shin that the ongoing rock-throwing spectacle hinders the harmonious accumulation of Tenchi. At that very moment, Earth Hand materializes before you, voicing her concern over the lack of advancement in three weeks. Resolute, she announces her intention to introduce a transformative element to facilitate Yu's journey in mastering Tenchi. With a spark of intrigue in his eyes, Yu reciprocates with a questioning gaze, curious about the innovative approaches she plans to unveil, promising potential acceleration in the Tenchi gathering endeavor. Without warning, Earth Hand seizes Yu's arm, a sudden and forceful action that propels him away from his original spot, leaving him caught off guard, his initial state of equilibrium disrupted by the abrupt intervention. Maintaining her hold on Yu's arm, Earth Hand, displaying a remarkable blend of strength and grace, propels herself onto the stones, deftly ascending the path that winds upward alongside the grandeur of the waterfall. Their ascent continues until they reach the pinnacle, the highest vantage point offering an expansive view of the surroundings. Standing at this elevated perch, Yu's eyes undergo a perceptible transformation, a deepening shade of apprehension creeping into his gaze as he peers down below, a palpable fear etched across his features. Perilously close to the brink, Yu teeters on the precipice, 
a single step away from a potential plunge into the abyss below, his sole salvation encapsulated in the tenacious grasp of Mizuki's hand. From below, Shin's voice reverberates, an inquiry into the unfolding drama transpiring above. Gazing down upon you with an enigmatic expression, Mizuki articulates that the precarious situation serves as a unique form of motivation, an unconventional catalyst for growth. Then, with deliberate intent, she releases her grip on Yu's hand, an image reminiscent of the iconic creation of Adam, an ethereal tableau unfolding against the backdrop of uncertainty. In utter disbelief, Yu grapples with the reality that Mizuki has relinquished her hold, fear coiling within him as he hurtles downward, a cascade of water becoming his descent. Mizuki, her gaze fixated on the plummeting figure of Yu, witnesses his anguished screams reverberate through the air, the relentless pull of gravity intensifying his downward trajectory. Shin, taken aback and bewildered, stands shocked by the unfolding spectacle, his usual composure shattered by the unexpected turn of events. Mizuki, in response to the turmoil below, a silent plea emanating from her, hopeful that Yu's descent will reveal a profound manifestation. As Yu descends, his gaze fixates on the impending collision with a rock below, hurtling headfirst towards a potentially dire impact. Mizuki, gripped by disbelief, clenches her teeth and initiates the channeling of a clandestine ninja art. With urgency, she taps her hand swiftly onto the ground beneath her. In a sudden burst, roots emerge, proliferating at an accelerated pace and the voracious roots, growing with unprecedented speed, entwine around you, abruptly halting his descent just moments before a calamitous collision with the unforgiving rocks below. With relief flooding through him, you inches away from the water's surface, his breaths coming in ragged pants, the specter of a perilous end still haunting him from mere seconds ago. Utilizing the roots, Mizuki descends the waterfall and anxiously inquires about Yu's well-being. In response, a flare of anger courses through Yu as he questions Mizuki's motives, demanding to know if he's merely a pawn in her game. Mizuki, realizing the impact of her actions, extends an apology, elucidating that fear often serves as a catalyst for the growth of struggling shinobi recruits. However, Yu, fueled by resentment, remains steadfast in his decision to ignore Mizuki's explanations, insisting on returning home. Despite Shin's plea to wait, Yu remains resolute, instructing Shin not to impede his departure. In an unexpected turn, Earth Hand, with a subtle flick of her finger, conjures forth the roots once more, this time ensnaring Yu's leg in their tenacious grip. Struggling against the constricting force, Yu issues a firm command to Earth Hand, demanding release from the entwining roots. Expressing her displeasure at Yu's demeanor, Earth Hand acknowledges his anger while firmly reminding him of her seniority. In response, Yu glances back at her, his eyebrows twitching as the realization dawns upon him. Subsequently, he looks downward, offering a gesture of apology and expressing regret for his actions. Earth Hand, in turn, directs her gaze towards you, asserting that he has attempted meditation and the fear-inducing method, yet neither has yielded the desired results, leaving her uncertain about the next course of action. Enveloped in self-disappointment, Yu shifts his gaze downward, fixating on his own hands as if searching for answers within the very palms that seem to have faltered. Beside him, Shin, grappling with the limitations of words, can only offer a silent gaze of understanding directed at you. With his back turned to both Shin and Earth Hand, Yu, with a tone of determination, requests another week from his companions, a week to grapple with his inner struggles and seek the elusive mastery that currently eludes him. Surveying Yu with a perplexed look, Earth Hand grapples with the nuance of his statement, struggling to fully comprehend his intentions. Undeterred, Yu, with a fierce and resolute countenance, declares that if, within the upcoming week, he fails to master the art of gathering Tenchi, he will withdraw from the training indefinitely, severing ties without a future return. Witnessing this newfound resolve in Yu, Earth Hand, catching the fervor of his determination, expresses agreement with palpable excitement, ready to witness the unfolding of this pivotal week. Within the nocturnal embrace of the Crimson Empire, the lights persistently illuminated Shin's residence. Meanwhile, Shin himself lay enveloped in the embrace of slumber, blissfully unaware and snoring softly amidst the tranquility of the night. In stark contrast, Yu, under the ambient glow, was engrossed in the careful perusal of a book, navigating the intricacies of its contents with a focused intensity. The finality of his reading session revealed the shinobi manual as the literary companion, and as he closed the manual shut, Yu cast the book aside, 
directing his gaze skyward and releasing a profound sigh into the night air. Eyes wide open, sleep eluding him, you lay in a state of wakefulness within the confines of the night. Beyond the walls, the full moon cast its radiant glow upon the Crimson Star Empire, a celestial beacon in the nocturnal expanse. Transported beyond the realm of slumber, you discovered himself on a grassy plain, an elevated vantage point affording a breathtaking panorama. The moonlit landscape unfolded before him, revealing a serene lake embraced by majestic mountains, an awe-inspiring tableau that held him captivated in the silence of the night. Convinced that a change of setting from the waterfall might yield better results, you embarked on a meditation venture amid the expansive grassy plains. Within the serene environment, a persistent mosquito disrupted the tranquility, its incessant buzzing reverberating around you. Landing on his cheek, it executed its familiar irritation, prompting a visible expression of annoyance on Yu's face. Frustrated, he abandoned the attempt to meditate, releasing a loud cry as his hands soared into the air in surrender. Yielding to the whims of nature, he reclined on his back, surrendering to the caress of the wind on the expansive grassy plains. Gazing contemplatively at the moon, its radiant glow casting an ethereal ambience, you found himself immersed in thoughts about the old man and his steadfast companion, Chonky. As he pondered their well-being, memories of shared adventures and camaraderie flooded his mind, evoking a sense of nostalgic warmth amidst the quietude of the night. Gradually, his reflections shifted to his mother, a profound wave of emotion washing over him as he raised his hands skyward. With a heavy heart, he wondered how she fared on the other side and if, in the cosmic dance of existence, she missed him as fervently as he longed for her presence. In the midst of the unfolding night, a nuanced revelation captivates Yu's awareness, redirecting his gaze towards a distant focal point. Within the canvas of moonlit brilliance, he discerns the presence of another enigmatic figure, a girl, seated upon a solitary rock, her countenance adorned with a paradoxical blend of calmness and an underlying disquiet. Then, Yu reaches out to her, pondering if she too finds sleep elusive amidst the weight of myriad thoughts. A profound silence envelopes the space between you and the mysterious girl, her gaze a silent testament to the enigma that veils her thoughts. In the intensity of that unwavering stare, a subtle transformation unfolds within you, an involuntary flush of warmth that paints his cheeks with a telltale blush. The moment, however, is short-lived as the girl, with an air of detachment, issues a chilling directive for you to mind his own business. Caught off guard by the cold reaction, you, his internal landscape clouded with confusion, nods in reluctant agreement, a subtle undercurrent of bewilderment permeating his expression. Grappling with the unanswered question of whether his words held an unintended sting, you chooses a prudent retreat. Embarking on a ascent, you ascends the rocky hills that, conveniently, double as a staircase, each step a testament to the arduous journey ahead. Reaching the summit, a panoramic spectacle unfolds before him, a breathtaking view of the entire Crimson Star Empire, bathed in the silver luminescence of the full moon. Amidst this celestial panorama, his discerning gaze locks onto a mysterious figure, an elderly man, standing stoically at the cliff's precipice. This enigmatic figure, characterized by a diminutive stature, a crown of white hair, and draped in a black cloak, exudes an aura of mystery against the moonlit backdrop. Reflecting upon what had just happened with the girl, Yu, mindful of the delicate dance of interactions, resolves to temper his words and instead, focus on the solitary rhythm of his own journey. In a narrative departure, the elderly figure, breaking the silence, extended an overture of conversation toward Yu, a shared appreciation blooming for the celestial spectacle before them. Yu acknowledged the greatness of the moonlit view and, seizing an opportune moment, inquired if sleep eluded the elderly stranger as well. With a nod of affirmation, the old man lent credence to Yu's suspicion of shared insomnia, creating a tenuous bridge between their nocturnal musings. Yu, concerned for the old man's safety, issued a gentle admonition against standing perilously close to the cliff's edge. However, in the blink of an eye, the elderly stranger traversed the distance with an astonishing agility, all the while remarking on the unfamiliarity of Yu's presence in his periphery. Mesmerized by the agility of the old man, Yu, his curiosity ignited, delved into an inquiry about the elderly stranger's potential affiliation with Shinobi. Confirming Yu's suspicions, the old man acknowledged a connection to the realm of Shinobi, a revelation that left Yu scratching his head in realization that, indeed, he had ventured into the heart of the Crimson Star Empire, 
a land where shinobis were commonplace. Yu on the other hand, nodding in acknowledgement, conceded that his roots extended beyond the boundaries of the Crimson Star Empire. The old man then remarked, Yu, although young of age, looked familiar. He then questions if he is training to become a shinobi. Yu, in earnest pursuit of shinobi mastery and the elusive art of meditation, confesses his current struggles on this arduous path. The aged sage shifts his gaze, revealing the depth of wisdom etched in his weathered face. His eyes, a mesmerizing shade of crimson, fixate on you with a knowing intensity. In a voice softened by the weight of years, he imparts a timeless truth, that the rhythm of learning varies for each soul. His words, like echoes from an ancient wellspring, reassure you that despite the twists and turns ahead, his path will lead to growth. Amidst the quietude of this introspective moment, you finds gratitude welling within him, a heartfelt acknowledgement of the old man's encouraging words. The ancient sage commences the unfolding of his narrative with the resonance of struggle in the early days of his journey with meditation. He unveils the choices that bore weight and the crucible of self-exploration that defined his journey. In the lunar ambience, he shifts his gaze to his hands, weathered and seasoned, having claimed the lives of hundreds, yet, paradoxically, having been the instruments that safeguarded the existence of millions. Yu responds with a soul-bearing confession, that all he once held dear has been ruthlessly torn from his grasp. In response, the old man, offers a luminous piece of counsel, protect the memories, for in preserving the echoes of the past lies the essence of enduring strength. Infused with a profound sense of gratitude, Yu shifts his gaze toward the spot where the old man once stood, only to discover an emptiness that mirrors the cosmic vastness. Yu grapples with the realization that he must acclimate to the peculiar phenomenon of individuals vanishing mid-conversation. In a sudden jolt of shock, the weight of the old man's revelation descends upon Yu's consciousness, as he grapples with the haunting admission that the sage, in the tapestry of his existence, carried the burden of having claimed the lives of hundreds. As the sun cast its golden hues upon the Crimson Star Empire, a few days later, Yu once again found himself immersed in the tranquility of the grassy plains. Seated in a meditative stance, he became a silhouette against the verdant backdrop, his form a testament to the disciplined pursuit of focus. Soon, the pastoral scene transformed into a lively canvas, as children, like bursts of joyous energy, scattered across the plains, engaging in playful pursuits that painted the meadow with the vibrant hues of youthful exuberance. Abruptly, a collective gasp escapes the children as their attention is seized by a swift apparition. It was none other than Shin, propelled by the ethereal force of Tenchi, hurtles through the grassy expanse with an almost otherworldly velocity. The children, caught in the whirlwind of Shin's passage, raise their voices in a chorus of concern, shouting warnings and admonitions to the speeding shinobi. Undeterred by the commotion, Shin, with an air of nonchalance, channels the Tenchi within him, delivering a resolute stomp upon the earth beneath. In an instant, the ground becomes a launch pad, propelling Shin skyward in a display of unbridled Tenchi mastery. Soaring towards the heavens, he effortlessly clears a tall tree that stands as a silent sentinel in his trajectory. Shin descends with unrivaled grace, his landing punctuating the aerial performance with a flourish of elegance. Earth Hand acknowledges the strides Shin has taken in mastering the intricacies of Tenchi control. In a harmonious exchange, Shin, humble yet brimming with confidence, aligns himself with the acknowledgement, expressing his readiness to confront the otherworldly foes that lurk in the shadows. However, Earth Hand, with a tempered demeanor, swiftly dispels the notion of immediate demon confrontation. Amidst the blossoming Tenchi proficiency of Shin, Earth Hand's gaze turns introspective, a silent query on the journey of another, the unfolding destiny of you in the realm of Tenchi. With a subtle turn, Earth Hand directs her gaze toward the solitary figure of you, engrossed in the sacred rhythm of meditation, a lone voyager navigating the ethereal currents of his inner world. Within the recesses of his contemplative thoughts, Yu delves into the haunting memories of the sixth hell demon, an indelible chapter etched in the annals of his consciousness. The mental tableau unfolds, revealing his mother's valiant struggle against the demonic adversary, a testament to her unwavering courage. However, the vivid recollection takes a somber turn as he revisits the catastrophic finale, where his mother succumbs, leaving behind a city veiled in the ominous shroud of a crimson explosion. A temporal shift propels him even further into the corridors of memory, to a time bathed in the warm hues of celebration, his birthday, a fleeting moment of joy before the shadows descended. On the tranquil balcony, 
Yu and his mother engage in a heartfelt exchange. Yu, inquisitive, unveils his wish, hoping to trade it for a glimpse into his mother's own birthday desires. In the quietude of the balcony, Yu shares his birthday wish, to ascend to the heights of affluence and become a billionaire. His mother, injecting a touch of levity, deems it a boring aspiration. Undaunted, Yu engages in a light-hearted banter, questioning the characterization of a wish that mirrors the universal desire for financial prosperity. Yu, having laid bare his own aspirations, turns the spotlight on his mother, curious about her birthday wish. Her response, a gentle chuckle followed by a revelation, that she is not of them who would want to become a billionaire. Beneath the balcony's gentle glow, Yu's mother, with a gaze filled with maternal tenderness, shares a sentiment that echoes with sincerity. Her words, though she acknowledges their potential cheesiness, carry a weight of unwavering love. She confides that, from the very day of Yu's birth, her singular wish has been to witness his happiness and growth, a heartfelt aspiration that remains untouched by the passage of time. As Yu gently opens his eyes, tears cascade down his cheeks, glistening like the morning dew. In the clarity of the moment, a profound realization dawns upon him, the days woven with the tender threads of his mother's presence stand as the most precious chapters of his life. A shared glance of astonishment passes between Mizuki and Shin as they observe you, tears carving rivers down his cheeks. In tandem with this display of raw emotion, the air stirs, a gentle zephyr materializing around him. Shin, his eyes reflecting a blend of curiosity and amazement, turns to Mizuki, voicing the question if it is the manifestation of Tenchi. Empowered by the gathered Tenchi pulsating within him, Yu, with resolute determination, takes a single step forward. In the sprawling branches of the colossal tree, the echoes of laughter from the little kids persist as they continue their playful escapade. A daredevil spirit emerges as one declares the intent to climb even higher, a personal conquest in the making. Amidst assurances that all will be well, an abrupt slip interrupts the sentence, and a collective gasp ensues as the daredevil plummets from the branch, a fleeting moment of terror etched on the faces of those who witness the unexpected descent. A sudden shift in the atmosphere as Earth Hand channels her power, pressing her hand to the earth. In response, roots surge forth from the ground, a natural intervention unfolding. With a calm reassurance, she urges the onlookers not to fret, assuring that she can handle the impending crisis. Yet, in a surge of lightning swiftness, dashing with nimble steps along the roots generated by Mizuki. Surpassing their speed, he orchestrates a gravity-defying leap, intercepting the falling child mid-air and becoming the guardian of the descending moment. In the midst of Yu's tear-stained eyes, a moment of triumph unfolds as he catches the falling boy mid-air. Amidst this heroic act, a realization grips him, their precarious perch on top of a cliff, and the ground below seems to stretch into an infinite abyss. With each movement, the space widens, creating a heart-stopping gap between them and the impending danger. Despite the urgency, Yu, still cradling the boy, issues a fervent demand for them to cling tightly to him, a desperate plea amidst the little kid's horrified cries predicting an imminent fall into the abyss. A sudden twist in the narrative as Earth Hand's roots extend down the cliff, intercepting Yu before he descends entirely. The intertwining of natural elements becomes a lifeline, preventing a plunge into the unknown depths. Gazing downward, Earth Hand and Shin, astonished, question the velocity of Yu's descent compared to Shin's own. In contemplation, Earth Hand believes that you might be faster. In a display of gratitude and remorse, the child, still teary-eyed, bows in an apologetic gesture, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. Yu, ever composed, responds with a calm assurance, expressing that the child is welcomed and urging him to exercise greater caution in the future. In the midst of the wind's gentle caress, Yu, introspective, gazes upon himself, contemplating whether the dance of elements signifies success in gathering Tenchi. A radiant Mizuki, with a smile that mirrors the brilliance of the moment, assures Yu of his triumph. In unison, Yu and Shin elevate their hands skyward, a jubilant celebration of overcoming the initial obstacle, a shared victory etched against the canvas of their collective efforts. Fueled by newfound confidence, Yu broaches the idea of confronting demons, an ambition swiftly extinguished by Earth Hand, who pragmatically redirects their focus back to the ongoing training. Earth Hand pulls out a tea bag and drops it into a cup, like a cozy ritual. She's perched on a branch, adding a kettle from thin air and filling the cup with water, as if nature is her kitchen. Remaining on the branch, she sips the tea, 
a moment suspended in time, where the world below and the tea above blend into serenity. Perched on the branch, she leaves her kettle, eyes fixed on her students, Yu and Shin. On the branch, the kettle sits, abandoned momentarily, as she observes Yu and Shin below. The grassy plains transform into a stage where two small figures challenge the magnitude of boulders, an allegory of strength and mentorship playing out in the quiet theater of nature. A stone brushes against a rope, signaling the triumph of one, and with a graceful descent, Shin declares victory on the grassy stage. Meanwhile, Yu, wearied from the toil of pushing the boulder, leans into it. As the day unfolds in a forest painted in shades of crimson, Yu and Shin dash through the canopy, a blur of motion among the autumn leaves. Yu seizes a branch, hand firmly gripping, using it to swing and propel himself forward, a display of agility amidst the red foliage. Meanwhile, Shin opts for a different approach, utilizing his legs to step gracefully from one branch to another, creating a rhythmic dance in the leafy embrace of the forest. Yu takes the leap, agile as a woodland sprite, navigating the tree branches with nimble hops. In his wake, Shin follows suit, a duo in a forest ballet. A crimson ribbon tied to a branch awaits, its vibrant hue a challenge suspended in mid-air. Shin, trailing behind, endeavors to bridge the distance, but Yu, with a tap of triumph, claims victory as the ribbon's captive, signaling the end of their arboreal race. In the next training session, the two boys find themselves atop tall logs, a precarious balance above the water's surface. Their focus sharpens as they stand on the edge of equilibrium, aware that one misstep could plunge them into the cool depths below. As Yu remains unaware, roots slowly creep from below, ascending the logs like silent climbers. In an abrupt, whip-like motion, the roots lash out towards the boys from behind, a surprise from nature's hidden arsenal. With deft movements, Yu sidesteps the woody onslaught, and mirroring his agility, Shin effortlessly evades the unexpected attack. Despite their evasive maneuvers, the relentless root attacks persist, forcing Yu and Shin to continuously dodge the whip-like assaults. In this arboreal battleground, Mizuki, a master of nature's elements, controls the branches with finesse. As the boys deftly dodge the woody lashes, Mizuki, from her vantage point, initiates the countdown, marking the conclusion of this intricate session of natural training. In the final moments of the training session, with a mere four seconds left, a root controlled by Mizuki snags onto Yu's foot, disrupting his balance as the seconds tick away. With only three seconds remaining, Yu teeters on the edge, poised for an imminent plunge into the waters below. Miraculously, in the nick of time, a hand extends, capturing him with just one second to spare, averting the impending fall and concluding the session with a breathless rescue. In a surprising twist, it's Shin who extends a saving hand, preventing you from plunging into the water as the countdown ends. Perplexed, you questions Shin's decision, wondering why he sacrificed a potential victory. With clarity, Shin outlines the rules, highlighting that success lies in standing after the 10 seconds, prompting you to consider the possibility of shared triumph. Pondering the idea of shared victory, Yu defers the final verdict to Earth Hand, their wise sensei, placing the decision in her hands. With the crisis averted, Shin takes a seat on the log, and Yu, securing himself by wrapping both hands and legs around the log, seeks Mizuki's verdict. Mizuki, Pleased by Shin's quick thinking, acknowledges the absence of any rule dictating failure and declares that both have passed. In a harmonious gesture, Yu and Shin applaud each other, marking the end of the challenging test and the beginning of their shared celebration. Having risen from her resting place, Mizuki conveys the completion of her instructional phase. Yet, in her parting remarks, she outlines the next chapter of their journey, they must persist in honing their physical strength to unlock greater reservoirs of Tenchi. The challenge is now in the hands of their muscles. A sense of anticipation fills Shin as he foresees more training on the horizon, an eager anticipation for the next challenge. On the flip side, Yu, expecting the conclusion of their training, wears disappointment on his face. Mizuki intervenes, extending her hand to reveal that Gravity Hand will take over the training from this point onward. The revelation leaves Shin and Yu in a state of both delight and perplexity, as they grapple with the enigma of what lies ahead. However, as Mizuki keeps her hand extended, a realization sets in. Gravity Hand, the supposed successor, is nowhere to be found. In a playful twist, Mizuki requests a few more seconds from the boys, her demeanor light-hearted. To their surprise, 
she adopts a deadpan poker face and, using her roots, elevates herself upward. At the top, she confronts an individual, expressing mild exasperation at being kept waiting, to which he casually apologizes. From her elevated vantage point, Mizuki imparts words of encouragement and wisdom to Gunma, the individual standing before her. Yu and Shin, their expressions a canvas of confusion, look upward, questioning the purpose of her ascent. In a leap that seems to defy gravity, she bids farewell to the boys, leaving them in a state of admiration. Yu, expressing gratitude, waves his hand as a symbolic gesture for the weeks filled with her teachings and guidance. In a moment of anticipation, Genma, also known as Gravity Hand, gathers his strength, clenching his fist and pressing it into his palm. With a purposeful demeanor, he stands ready to reveal his true self to the awaiting boys. Poised for the big reveal, he talks to himself in a unique and somewhat narcissistic form of encouragement. As Shin and Yu cast their eyes upward, they spot an individual perched atop the cliff, an imposing figure with a raised hand. The mysterious figure questions the duo about their readiness to embark on a journey of muscle growth. Yu, wearing a bemused expression, gazes at the individual with a hint of skepticism, entertaining the amusing thought that this might be the elusive gravity hand they've heard about. Upon the revelation of Gravity Hand's identity, beads of sweat form on his forehead, hinting at a hidden concern or uncertainty. Despite the worry, he boldly takes the next step, jumping off the cliff without the safety of a parachute. Yu, witnessing this audacious act, quickly gauges the height, realizing that it must be a staggering four stories or more. True to his name, Gravity Hand defies the norm, slowing his descent as he takes control of gravity itself. Shin, in awe, notes that gravity hand falls with the grace of a feather. Yu, bewildered by the apparent defiance of gravity, questions the reality of what he is witnessing. Landing gracefully on the water's surface, gravity hand greets the boys, declaring his takeover of the upcoming training phase. Observing gravity hand standing on water, Yu can't contain his curiosity and asks if they are going to learn that skill too. Gravity hand, with a gentle denial, clarifies that standing on water is his unique ability. Disappointment clouds Yu's face, his expectations crashing as he realizes this particular feat is beyond their training. His sad expression speaks volumes about the dashed hopes. Gravity Hand, perceptive to his student's disappointment, finds himself in the grip of internal turmoil. A storm of self-doubt brews within him as he questions whether he might have made a misstep even before the training began. The weight of his student's dissatisfaction becomes a heavy burden, casting shadows of uncertainty over his role as their instructor. As Yu begins introducing himself and his companion, Gravity Hand cuts him off mid-sentence, leaving the introduction incomplete. Yu, curious, questions if Gravity Hand has the ability to read minds, surprised by the completion of the sentence by his mentor. Meanwhile, Gravity Hand, thinking he executed a brilliant maneuver, stands tall with pride, a broad smile stretching across his face, hands confidently placed on his waist. In a revelation, Shin exclaims that Earth Hand has already communicated their names to Gravity Hand. He adds that they all share a calendar on their phones. Looking at the date, Shin points out that despite being the newest hand, Gravity Hand is, in fact, late for their meeting. In response to Shin's revelation, Gravity Hand, with little to say, simply places a hand on his face, a gesture of slight embarrassment. The quiet acknowledgement adds a touch of humility to the situation, as Gravity Hand grapples with the realization of being caught off guard. We are then transported to a distinct scene, reminiscent of a mortuary, where a doctor and a red-headed figure conduct a detailed examination of a deceased body. The doctor points at the lifeless body, meticulously explaining to the red-headed individual the presence of a surgical wound. Delving deeper into the analysis, the doctor reveals that, perplexingly, the person was awake and not under sedation during the operation. The precision of the incision surpasses the capabilities of their latest equipment, leading to the unsettling realization that the victim was alive while undergoing the surgical procedure. The gravity of the revelation settles between them, and the doctor nods in agreement as the red-headed individual comprehends the disturbing nature of the situation. The red-headed individual grimly states that this marks the eighth victim who has succumbed to the same cause, emphasizing the urgency to stop the serial killer. Abruptly, the doctor's attention is drawn to something unusual, prompting him to inquire about it. With precision, he retrieves a paper from the body's wound, introducing an unexpected element to the investigation. The redhead, intrigued, 
queries the doctor about the significance of the paper, intensifying the mystery surrounding the unfolding investigation. The doctor delicately unfolds the paper, revealing a handwritten note in an unknown language. Both the doctor and the red-headed individual peer at the mysterious script, coming to the shared realization that the note was likely left by the serial killer. The red-headed individual takes a swift action, capturing a photo of the paper with her smartphone, expressing confidence that she knows someone capable of decrypting the mysterious message. With a quick message, she sends the photo to her contact. Almost immediately, a reply flashes on her screen, indicating a prompt need for a face-to-face -face meeting. With urgency, she swiftly departs, removing her mask as she goes. The doctor attempts to detain her, expressing that there are more findings to share, but she dismisses him, stating that she has seen enough. The departure is marked by a sense of determination and closure. Two weeks later, in the serene confines of the Crimson Empire, Yu is diligently seen strengthening his legs. Positioned beneath a massive boulder, he exerts himself by pushing it upward, engaging in focused and determined physical training. Completing his 19th repetition, Yu channels all the remaining force in his legs for the 20th, hurling the substantial boulder over to Shin. With impressive strength, Shin catches it, now holding the weight over his head. Transitioning seamlessly, Shin embarks on a series of rapid overhead raises, demonstrating not only strength but also a quick and fluid motion. Observing Yu's efforts, Gravity Hand declares that their training for the day is complete. Yu, questioning if this is indeed the entirety of their daily training, seeks confirmation. Meanwhile, Shin, displaying his strength, discards the boulder onto the ground, its sheer weight causing it to sink. Shin, claiming today's training was too easy, attributes the initial difficulty to quick adaptation, showcasing their rapid acclimatization. Examining his muscles, Yu reflects on the progress made in just two weeks, expressing a sense of mild disappointment as he expected faster growth. Gravity Hand, recognizing the ease of the training for them, acknowledges that a more rigorous regimen should have been prepared. As the session concludes, the boys bid their farewells to Gravity Hand, ready to move on from the day's training. Faced with self-doubt, Gravity Hand, in a subdued tone, offers a subtle apology for what he perceives as a failure in their training. Delving deeper into introspection, he questions the very core of his qualifications, expressing uncertainty about whether he is truly qualified to be a hand. In a magical instance, a branch materializes beside Genma, presenting a cup of tea. A gentle and reassuring voice, revealed to be Earth Hand, invites him to enjoy the tea. Genma, recognizing her presence, remarks that he was on his way to visit her. Bowing apologetically, Genma confesses to Earth Hand that their growth is not progressing quickly enough for them to become shinobi in the coming year. In an apparent moment of self-doubt, he questions his suitability for their training. Contrary to his belief, Mizuki opposes Genma's statement, asserting that he is indeed the right person for their training. Wearing a confused expression, Genma looks up as Earth Hand provides clarification. She elucidates that Genma has been training them like ordinary recruits, emphasizing that conventional resistance training, even with the use of Tenchi, will not yield swift results. Continuing her explanation, Earth Hand emphasizes that Genma was chosen to be their trainer precisely because of his exceptional ability to manipulate gravity. Encouraging him to trust in his unique skills and to approach training with creativity, she firmly declares that she will not accept his resignation. Genma furrowed his brow in confusion, a perplexed expression washing over his features like a passing shadow. Doubt crept into his mind, a subtle whisper questioning the very foundations of his abilities. Earth Hand further reveals that every other hand has unanimously agreed for Genma to join them as a fellow hand, emphasizing that he is more capable than he perceives. Gravity Hand, now with a visibly brightened face, queries specifically about Fire Hand's vote, seeking reassurance. As Earth Hand begins to recollect that Fire Hand was initially opposed to Genma becoming a hand, citing his lack of confidence, beads of sweat form on her face, indicating a sense of discomfort and concern. Steering the conversation in a different direction, Earth Hand advises Genma to prepare for Yu and Shin's next training session. As Genma leaves, he grapples with the astonishing realization that Fire Hand, his idol, has given approval for him to become a hand. Earth Hand, unable to disclose the full truth, responds with silent laughter, concealing the intricacies of the past dynamics among the hands. The training location resembles a cave, but it's formed by colossal mountains on each side, with massive circular entries on top. 
Pillars support the roof, and a small dome is positioned in the center. Yu and Shin stand on the expansive opening of this gargantuan mountainous cave. Yu, expressing excitement, questions if this is indeed their designated training spot, Shin nods with agreement. Yu, unable to contain his enthusiasm, jumps first, prompting Shin to question what he's waiting for. Yu gracefully lands on the dome-like structure, feeling the firmness beneath his feet as he takes in the intricate details of its design. Swiftly, Shin follows suit, and Yu, pleasantly surprised, acknowledges the remarkable sturdiness of the dome. In contrast, Shin, displaying a touch of skepticism, assumes that Gravity Hand must be running late again but speak of the devil, Yu spots Gravity Hand already positioned below, calling out to them, seemingly defying any notion of tardiness. Curious, Shin taps on the dome structure, noting that it feels and sounds like wood but significantly firmer. Gravity Hand affirms Shin's observation, revealing that the structure is crafted from compressed wood and roots. He shares that he spent three sleepless nights meticulously creating this hut for their new training. The trio marvels at the robustness of the structure, and Gravity Hand confidently asserts that it is stronger than concrete. Shin, puzzled, questions why a structure of such strength would necessitate their training. With a gesture, Gravity Hand invites them inside, and Yu comments on the emptiness of the interior. Gravity Hand, poised with his hand in the air, prepares to unleash the secret ninja art that will initiate their training. Suddenly, Shin and Yu feel an intensified force pulling them toward the ground as gravity takes a stronger hold. Despite the gravitational pressure exerted by Gravity Hand's secret ninja art, the hut remains upright, resisting any crushing force. Under the intensified gravitational pressure, Shin struggles to breathe, while Yu remains clueless about their predicament. The force is so potent that Shin's glasses begin to crack, showcasing the immense strain. At that moment, behind Gravity Hand, a massive circular void takes shape, with rays of light swirling around, a manifestation of his gravity manipulation. Gravity Hand proceeds to explain that he has amplified the gravitational force inside the hut by 12 times, a method he believes will significantly enhance speed and muscle development. Yu, struggling against the force, expresses concern, exclaiming that they'll end up getting crushed like pancakes before seeing any improvement. Offering reassurance to Yu, Gravity Hand instructs him not to worry, emphasizing his vigilant supervision throughout their training. Shin then questions what are they trying to achieve here in this hut being pulled by gravity. He also reminds his students that increased muscle mass leads to a greater capacity for absorbing tenchi. When Shin queries the purpose of enduring the hut's gravitational pull, Gravity Hand simplifies the objective, stating that they must acclimate to the pressure, a seemingly simple but demanding task. Gravity Hand emphasizes the urgency, reminding them that they have only a month until their next training, with the next hand being someone they shouldn't keep waiting. With a leisurely stroll, Gravity Hand walks away, prompting you to question whether he intends to leave them in that condition. Earth Hand simply agrees. On the 23rd of November, the boys find it challenging just to stand under the intensified gravitational pressure. However, with just a few days passing by, Shin manages to raise his foot, showcasing incremental progress. As November draws to a close, the boys start moving more freely, gaining the ability to run and even jump. By the beginning of December, they commence sparring with each other, and just like that, the month flies by in their training within the hut. Having observed their progress, Gravity Hand is pleasantly surprised to find that his students can now move freely. Acknowledging the remarkable progress made by Yu and Shin, he interrupts their sparring session to announce that it's time to move on to the next stage. Both boys halt in surprise, questioning what the next stage entails. Pointing to himself, Gravity Hand declares that he is the next stage, instructing them to fight him with everything they've got. Both boys wear a dumbfounded expression, with you questioning how they can engage in combat when they haven't been taught any skills. Gravity Hand dismisses the concern, stating that it doesn't matter. He simply wants to witness the results of their training. The students, in agreement with their sensei's request, prepare for the challenge. Yu, gearing up, inquires whether Shin will be the first to strike. Gravity Hand issues a warning that if they don't initiate the attack, he will be the one coming for them. Surrounded by the energy of Tenchi, Gravity Hand advances towards them. Yu is taken aback by the declaration and the overwhelming aura emanating from Gravity Hand. With one foot firmly planted on the ground, Gravity Hand prepares to propel himself forward, warning the boys once again that he is coming for them. 
Shin is taken aback by the overwhelming amount of tenchi that Gravity Hand is emitting. Both boys grasp the seriousness of the situation, realizing that it's no longer a game. With one powerful leap, Gravity Hand comes flying at them, hands positioned behind him, poised to strike down the boys like a viper. As the attack approaches, the boys understand that sitting idly is not an option. Consequently, they begin to advance toward their oncoming sensei. However, at that precise moment, Gravity Hand hears a voice declaring that she's had enough of this. The boys, still in motion, successfully connect their punches, Yu striking Gravity Hand's face and Shin hitting his ribs. With determined eyes, Yu continues to apply as much pressure as he can on Gravity Hand's face. Simultaneously, Shin does the same. They acknowledge their luck in getting the first shot and understand the importance of giving their all in this crucial moment. In a surprising turn of events, Gravity Hand is the one who steps back, his eyes widening in realization. He swiftly raises his hand, signaling for the boys to wait, and with a mix of shock and anticipation, he declares that someone has arrived. However, the boys, wincing in pain, vehemently assert that Gravity Hand's body is tougher than steel, revealing the physical toll of their relentless assault. Yu, his curiosity sparked like a flame, questions the presence of the individual that Gravity Hand is talking about. Suddenly, a voice emerges from beneath the boys, claiming to be right under their feet. Intrigued, Yu and Shin swiftly turn around, scanning the hut, but all they see is emptiness, leaving them in a state of bewilderment. Yu questions who is talking, his brows furrowed in confusion as he scans the surroundings, unable to see anyone. In response, a tiny voice, like a gentle breeze, questions again if she is not visible, leaving you even more puzzled. She then comments that Shin's and Yu's eyesight is just plain terrible, her voice carrying a frustrated tone. Suddenly, she jumps up, and a sense of wonder fills the air as she starts to grow rapidly, her form expanding. Suddenly, she descends with a heavy stomp, creating a resonating impact that echoes through the surroundings. Yu and Shin, caught off guard, swiftly turn to see the mysterious figure now standing behind them. With an authoritative presence, this little figure then commands the immediate cessation of Gravity Hand's training, her words carrying an unexpected weight. Yu, intrigued and bewildered, questions who she is and where she came from, seeking answers to the sudden disruption. In a sudden gesture of respect, Gravity Hand bows deeply, acknowledging Adam Hand's presence with a display of deference, greeting her as a senpai. The air in the training area shifts, infused with a sense of hierarchy and camaraderie. Shin is taken aback, his eyes widening with surprise, as he hears the title Adam Hand, a term that carries an unexpected weight. Simultaneously, Yu is shocked to learn that the seemingly small and unassuming figure before Gravity Hand is actually his senpai, a revelation that reshapes his perception. Gravity Hand's forehead glistens with beads of sweat, a silent testament to the mounting uncertainty clouding his expression. Tentatively, he inquires of his senpai, casting a shadow of doubt upon the carefully arranged dates. Adam Hand, unwavering and poised, refutes any insinuation of misjudgment with a firm denial. In the vast expanse of the Crimson Star Empire, Shin, a longtime dweller, unravels a unique revelation to you. This marks his first sighting of her, and he underscores the air of mystery surrounding her, her appearance veiled in the shroud of the unknown. Fixing her gaze upon Gravity Hand, Adam Hand asserts with a firm conviction that her patience wore thin, a testament to her growing weariness in anticipating his effective training of the boys. However, she does extend a nod of acknowledgement, recognizing his eventual attainment of the goals set before him. In the relentless cascade of his senpai's lecture, Gravity Hand becomes a canvas for descending beads of sweat, each one a testament to the weight of the words. His only recourse is a repetitive nodding. With a decisive gesture, Adam Hand extends her arm, pointing towards the two boys, an assertive declaration that her watchful gaze has been fixed upon them throughout. Further, she discloses an additional revelation, her keen observation has not spared Gravity Hand either. Gravity Hand extends his hand in a gesture of respect, a silent acknowledgement that he anticipated nothing short of excellence from his senpai. In this fleeting moment, Yu begins a deliberate approach, a gradual movement towards the duo that unfolds with an air of intrigue. Wearing a puzzled expression, Yu's gaze locks onto Adam Hand with a discerning intensity. His furrowed brow and thoughtful eyes convey a sense of deep contemplation, as if he's trying to decipher a complex riddle hidden within Adam Hand's presence. 
Adam Hand, exuding an aura of casual indifference, casually redirects her gaze to you. The calm assurance in her eyes creates a moment of silent connection, as if acknowledging the presence of you with a nonchalant grace. You shatters the silence with a pointed query, his finger directing attention to Adam Hand. His inquiry carries a hint of curiosity, as if pondering whether her height is indicative of an incomplete mastery of technique. Gravity Hand's eyes undergo a profound transformation, widening like a doorway into astonishment, and his mouth opens in disbelief as Yu's question reverberates. The depth of shock in his gaze tells a tale of a realization, a knowledge ingrained in him that discussing Adam Hand's height is a precarious path not meant to be treaded upon. Like a tempest casting a shadow over her features, Adam Hand's face darkens with an air of discontent. A melancholy smirk, reminiscent of an antagonist savoring their malevolence, graces her lips, adding an intriguing layer to the complexity of her character. In that suspended moment, a silent exchange devoid of words unfolds, and Adam Hand raises her hand towards you. Its significance hangs in the air, leaving you grappling with the ambiguity. Despite the uncertainty, you, guided by instinct, extends his hand for a handshake, bridging the unspoken gap with a simple yet profound act. As the firm handshake unites their hands, little does you fathom that this seemingly innocuous act marks his inadvertent plunge into an unforeseen abyss. Abruptly, as if the laws of physics themselves rebelled, his entire being begins a metamorphosis, diminishing to a minuscule size akin to that of an ant. The astonishment radiates from Yu's gaze as he witnesses the surreal transformation of his own body. Adam Hand remains unmoving, a stoic figure amidst the unfolding consequences. Gravity Hand, on the other hand, grapples with disbelief, his countenance a canvas of shock and astonishment. The lines etched on his face tell a tale of incredulity as he comprehends the magnitude of Yu's unexpected transformation. Meanwhile, Shin, oblivious to the mysterious turn of events, stands in puzzlement, wondering about Yu's sudden disappearance. Enveloped by the towering blades of grass, Yu exists as a miniature presence, a mere fraction of his former self. His bewildered gaze scans the transformed landscape, grappling with the enormity of his shrunken reality. Amidst the echoes of Yu's fervent cries, Shin is met with a perplexing challenge, despite his earnest search, Yu remains elusive within the confines of the hut. As Yu maneuvers through the verdant expanse of grass, his perplexed steps mirror the uncertainty of his thoughts. Yu contemplates the possibility that this may be an unorthodox training, a test of his adaptability and problem-solving skills amid the swaying sea of green. However, in response to Yu's arrogant comment, Adam Hand fixes a gaze upon him, her eyes mirroring not just annoyance but also a simmering displeasure. Her stare becomes a force, a quiet counterpoint to the audacity of Yu's words, leaving an unspoken tension hanging in the air. Gravity Hand, embodying humility, clasps his hands together in a plea for forgiveness. His eyes mirror sincerity as he implores Adam Hand to pardon you, emphasizing the diligent nature of his fellow student and the well-intentioned nature behind his words. However, Adam Hand, adopting a demeanor akin to a spoiled child, dismisses the plea with a stubborn denial, her gaze defiantly directed away. As awareness descends upon you, he discerns a subtle movement around him. Red ants, akin to stealthy scouts, commence a silent advance. The grassy terrain transforms into a covert battleground, the tiny invaders converging upon you with a meticulous precision that amplifies the surreal nature of the unfolding scene. Shock washes over Yu's features, the realization of the impending invasion evident in his widened eyes. Beads of sweat, like tiny heralds of anxiety, form on his forehead as the sheer number and size of the approaching red ants become apparent. Worry casts a shadow on Shin's face as he poses a question to Adam Hand. His gaze, a searching inquiry, delves into the possibility that you might have traversed into another dimension. Her eyes darkening like an evil person while holding a paper plane in her hand, claims that Yu is having the time of his life. Adam Hand, maintaining an outward semblance of casual indifference, responds with a reassuring tone, soothing Shin's apprehensions by assuring him that Yu remains unscathed. Contrary to Adam Hand's assertions, Yu is in the midst of a desperate flight, each step a heartbeat in his frantic escape from the approaching swarm of ants. Yu's cries reverberate through the air, a distress as the horde of ants closes in on him. Amidst the cacophony, Shin becomes aware of the desperate calls, but the source remains elusive. Clutching a paper plane in her hand, Adam Hand declares that the time for departure is at hand. Amidst the urgency of his escape, 
Yu's perception undergoes a sudden shift. The once ominous horde, now revealed as a group of ordinary ants, transforms the narrative from one of frantic evasion to a dance with diminutive adversaries. In a sudden shift of momentum, Yu comes to an abrupt halt, the force of his determination causing the very air to ripple around him. With a determined pivot, he turns around to face the oncoming ants, his stance a testament to a newfound readiness to confront the impending challenge. In a display of unexpected agility, Yu executes a dynamic leap, capturing an ant in each arm with a grace akin to a practiced wrestling move. With an explosion of force, Yu channels all his might into a thunderous punch, propelling the captured ants through the air like miniature projectiles. As if guided by an unseen force, the expelled ants soar through the air, their flight path aligning with an unintended destination, Shin's face. Shin, wearing an expression of utter confusion, tilts his head in wonder as the tiny ants target him with unexpected precision. Unseen by Shin, Adam Hand entrusts Genma with a paper plane, its paper wings bearing the weight of an unspoken directive, poised to sail northward upon Adam Hand's discreet signal. Adam Hand extends her slender finger towards Shin, the gesture carrying an air of authority as she beckons him to approach. Shin, caught in a moment of uncertainty, squints slightly, unsure if the authoritative point was directed towards him. Affirming Shin's inquiry with a reassuring smile, Adam Hand affirms that her call was intended for him, dispelling any lingering doubts. Her hand extends once more, an open invitation for Shin to join in the unspoken exchange. Shin, navigating the unfamiliar terrain of social cues, mirrors Adam Hand's gesture and extends his hand for a handshake, his expression a blend of curiosity and compliance. Abruptly, a vacuum of nothingness envelopes them both, their forms disappearing from view in an instant, leaving behind an eerie stillness in the expansive realm. The ants, survivors of the miniature warfare with you, bear the marks of their encounter, their tiny bodies revealing the toll of the battle. You, wiping beads of sweat from his brow, downplays the intensity of the skirmish, claiming the encounter was manageable, his demeanor exuding a sense of triumph in the face of the tiny adversaries. As you revels in the aftermath of the ant skirmish, a colossal shadow looms over him, prompting a curious turn of his gaze. To his surprise, a formidable praying mantis hovers above him, poised for an imminent assault, its predatory intent echoing in the stillness of the hut. The colossal praying mantis, sensing an opportunity, extends its razor-sharp claws in a swift strike aimed at its unsuspecting prey. Miraculously, Yu, in a split-second maneuver, intercepts the dual blades with his bare hand, a daring display of agility that halts the predator in its tracks. Frustration creeps onto Yu's features, irritation evident as he contemplates the succession of challenges, first, the relentless ants, and now an imposing praying mantis adds another layer to his exasperation. The praying mantis, its hunger evident in the widening of its mandibles, positions itself for a predatory strike, eyeing Yu as its next meal. Undeterred, Yu, fueled by a surge of defiance, shouts back, declaring that the mantis may attempt its feast, but it won't claim a morsel of him. In the crucial moment, a massive circular projectile hurtles through the air, colliding with the praying mantis with forceful impact, sending it tumbling away. Yu, caught off guard, witnesses the unexpected intervention, his eyes widening as the scene unfolds before him in a surreal turn of events. It becomes apparent that Adam Hand is the architect behind the unexpected intervention. With a declarative statement, she asserts that the time for Yu's play has concluded. Shin, gripped by concern, finally spots Yu amidst the chaos, a wave of relief washing over him as he discovers his friend's whereabouts. Yu, meeting Shin's gaze, recognizes a shared fate, a realization dawning upon him that Shin, too, has succumbed to the mysterious shrinking phenomenon. Puzzled by the surreal turn of events, Yu turns to Shin with a questioning gaze, wondering if this is an elaborate facet of their training. However, Shin, equally perplexed, denies any knowledge, leaving Yu to grapple with the enigma. Meanwhile, the once formidable mantis lies sprawled on the grass, its fate uncertain, either defeated or incapacitated by the mysterious intervention. Adam Hand steps forward, her presence authoritative, and delivers a crucial lesson to you. She points out that if he wishes to evade the fate of being mantis food, he must cultivate a demeanor of respect when addressing his senpais. The weight of Adam Hand's advice bears down on you, beads of sweat materializing on his face as a physical manifestation of the pressure. In response, he hastily nods in agreement, a hint of fear lingering in his eyes, 
apprehensive of the potential consequences that might unfold. Adam Hand propels herself skyward with a single, powerful leap, a display of agility that defies the ordinary. In an instant, Shin experiences a sudden acceleration, caught up in a rapid movement initiated by Adam Hand's extraordinary leap. Simultaneously, Yu, too, becomes a participant in the unforeseen motion, whisked away by the commanding force of Adam Hand. It becomes evident that it was none other than Adam Hand who, with a firm grasp on their hands, effortlessly hoists the two boys into the air. With precision, she lands on a paper airplane, lowering the boys to the ground in a whimsical conclusion to their airborne escapade. Adam Hand, with an air of authority, instructs Gravity Hand to propel them northwards, a directive that unfolds with a commanding presence. Gravity Hand, a realization dawning upon him, discerns that their trajectory aligns with the treacherous path leading to the Castle of Traps. Expressing doubt, he questions if it's too early for such a perilous endeavor. Contrary to Gravity Hand's reservations, Adam Hand, with an unwavering certainty, recognizes that the two boys are prepared for the challenges ahead, a silent assurance that propels them towards the impending trials. Gravity Hand, aligning with the wisdom of his senpai, nods in agreement, a silent acknowledgement of Adam Hand's guidance. With a determined resolve, he retracts his arm, preparing to unleash the paper plane into the northward expanse. In a fluid and decisive motion, he releases the paper craft into the air, a beacon of encouragement emanating from him, urging his fellow students to embrace the forthcoming trials with unwavering determination. Propelled by the force of the paper plane, the two boys soar through the air, their firm grasp on the craft a lifeline in the winds. The sheer momentum elicits open-mouthed expressions, a blend of awe and excitement etched across their faces as they navigate the currents of the northward trajectory. En route to the daunting castle of traps, Shin, amidst the airborne journey, shares with his fellow companion that this marks his first flight on a plane. Amidst the illumination of a house bathed in the gentle daylight of the Crimson Star Empire, the ordinary scenes of daily life unfold with a warmth that permeates the familiar surroundings. The room exudes a peaceful ambience as Yakomi, Shin's friend, lies in undisturbed slumber, a picture of calm amidst the tranquility. Abruptly, the spell is broken as her Samsung Galaxy Flip 3 5G, positioned nearby, erupts in the clamor of its alarm, stirring the room with an unexpected intrusion of sound. Startled from her peaceful repose, Yakomi jolts upright, her eyes widening in response to the intrusive sound of the alarm. As she retrieves her phone to check the time, a realization dawns upon her, this particular alarm was the eighth snooze, a realization settling upon her with a subtle sense of urgency. Rising from her bed to commence the day's preparations, Yakomi's focus shifts as her computer unexpectedly emits a ringing sound, introducing a layer of digital urgency to the morning routine. The unexpected call is identified, emanating from Yakomi's father, whose virtual presence breaks through the silence of the morning. Upon answering her father's call, Yakomi finds herself in a conversation where he, with a curious tone, questions her current activity. In response, she casually mentions that she's in the midst of brushing her teeth, a mundane yet intimate detail of her morning routine. However, the conversation takes a turn as he corrects himself, inquiring about her dedication to training. With a resolute affirmation, she acknowledges her commitment to the training sessions, pushing back against his attempts to dissuade her. Undeterred, her father persistently urges her to reconsider, extending an invitation to join him at the research division. He paints a vivid picture of limitless possibilities, appealing to her creativity and emphasizing the value of her unique talents within their team. Yakomi, standing firm in her choices, counters her father's suggestions with a resolute assertion that she can navigate the realms of both science and the way of the shinobi simultaneously. Her declaration challenges the notion that these paths must be exclusive, signaling a commitment to carve a unique trajectory that weaves together the analytical world of science with the disciplined artistry of the shinobi. Amidst the exchange, Yakomi's father takes a reflective stance, invoking the family's lineage as he gently reminds her that their ancestry doesn't echo with the footsteps of long-standing shinobi tradition, unlike some of their peers. He shifts the narrative, emphasizing their family's unique strength in inventing, creating, and constructing tools specifically tailored for shinobi. With a touch of parental concern, he brings forth the stark reality of danger inherent in the life of a shinobi, delicately nudging his daughter to consider the path she treads. In response to her father's cautionary words, Yakomi, with a thoughtful glint in her eyes, 
suggests an alternative perspective. She proposes that the most effective way to comprehend the genuine needs of the shinobi is to immerse oneself in their world, on the battlefield, where the intricacies of their challenges unfold. In a heartfelt plea, Yakomi's father, seeking a moment of attentive consideration, implores her to lend an ear to his words. There's a sincerity in his plea, an earnest desire to be heard. In a moment of back and forth exchanges, he attributes Yakomi's stubborn streak to her mother. Following her father's plea, an awkward silence descends upon the room as Yakomi shifts her gaze towards the monitor. Simultaneously, her father, caught in the weight of his own words, maintains a quiet stance, the air heavy with unspoken emotions lingering after the mention of Yakomi's mother. As her father prepares to resume speaking, Yakomi, sensing the impending continuation of a difficult conversation, deftly interjects. With a sense of urgency, she informs him that she must depart, swiftly concluding the call. Turning her attention back to the computer screen, Yakomi, with a sigh, vents her frustration. The monitor reflects a mix of irritation and resignation in her eyes as she contemplates the complexities of her relationship with her father. In the heart of the bamboo-laden sanctuary within the Crimson Star Empire, the air is permeated with a tranquil stillness. With a grace akin to the wind, Yakomi navigates the bamboo forest at a relentless pace. Her figure, a streak of energy, threads through the intricate maze of slender stems. Glancing at the digital display of her smartwatch, Yakomi's eyes widen upon looking at the time, a stark reminder that she is getting late to today's exorcism training. In the midst of her urgent dash, Yakomi's mind races with the awareness that time is slipping away. A brief pause disrupts her rhythm as she comes to a halt, swiftly reaching into her backpack. With a focused determination, she retrieves a mysterious gadget. A sense of curiosity fills the air as Yakomi extracts a circular object from her bag. The contours of the item, creating an almost sci-fi sensation. With a decisive air, she deems the present moment perfect for her to try out her new gadget. With a flick of her wrist, Yakomi propels the circular object into the air and commands Rex-9 to show her the quickest way to the Clan-6 training ground. Rex-9 while floating in the air, pops up the top part of its body and emits a sort of laser. With a hum of intricate computations, Rex-9 engages in the task of root calculation. In tandem, Yakomi's augmented reality glasses illuminate with a navigational sign, casting a digital glow on her focused expression. She indicates the augment reality glasses are working well and it tells her to take a right turn. Energized by the digital guidance, Yakomi continues her sprint through the bamboo forest. Rex-9, a faithful companion, hovers right behind her, emitting directional commands that blend seamlessly with the ambient sounds of nature. Amidst her sprint, a structure materializes in Yakomi's line of sight, its silhouette emerging through the bamboo foliage. A surge of triumph courses through her as she believes the Clan 6 training ground is now within reach. Upon reaching the building, Yakomi notices a discrepancy, it doesn't bear the markings of a typical shinobi training base. A subtle frown creases her forehead as she consults Rex-9, questioning their location with a curious tilt of her head. In response to Yakomi's inquiry, Rex-9 calmly asserts that they have indeed arrived at Clan 6 training ground. Fueled by confidence in her gadget's guidance, Yakomi approaches the door with a sense of purpose. The building, standing as a gateway to Clan 6 training ground, bears silent witness to her determined advance. As the door swings open, Yakomi is met with a scene that defies her expectations, leaving her momentarily dumbfounded. A sudden flush of embarrassment colors Yakomi's cheeks as she comprehends the nature of her discovery. She has unwittingly stepped into the boys' changing room. In the boys' changing room, Yakomi is met with a mix of reactions. One boy recognizes her with a friendly nod, while another, spotting Rex-9's presence, raises an amused eyebrow and questions her about potential spying endeavors. Embarrassment paints Yakomi's face with glistening beads of sweat as she endeavors to unravel the misunderstanding. Desperate to clarify, she points towards Rex-9, stressing that the floating machine is far from the clandestine tool they might believe it to be. The boys, caught in a mix of confusion and jest, request Yakomi to leave the changing room. As she hurries away, a fleeting sense of blame colors her expression, directed towards Rex-9 for inadvertently thrusting her into this awkward predicament. As Yakomi makes her way out of the changing room, a distant figure spots her and calls out. The figure, revealed to be Mr. Makoto, her sensei, shouts that everyone awaits her at the training ground, 
emphasizing that she has taken the wrong path. Yakomi, still adorned with beads of sweat from the previous awkward encounter, is relieved to have finally found her guiding figure amidst the bamboo-laden landscape. As the sun gracefully descends in the Crimson Star Empire, its rays paint the sky in a symphony of warm hues, casting a farewell glow over the expansive horizon. Perched on the sturdy branch, a girl, delicately holds a long knife in her grasp. With measured movements, she wipes the blade clean with a cloth, each stroke revealing intricate patterns etched into the steel. As she meticulously wipes the knife, a furrow forms on her brow, and the seriousness etched on her face tells tales of a mind immersed in profound thoughts. Emerging like a frosty apparition, Ice Hand materializes before her. His presence conveys an urgency, as if the very air around it carries a message meant solely for Ichika, a revelation locked within the frozen embrace. A wave of unease washes over Ichika as she turns her gaze toward Ice Hand. The question about her brother lingers in the air, accompanied by a subtle tension, as she awaits any information that might offer solace in the gathering dusk. Ice Hand's words ripple through the air, revealing the ongoing search for Ichika's brother and adding a layer of complexity by mentioning the involvement of the fifth clan head. The head of clan five being her mother, wonders what it could be about. The last time she heard of her was when she was on a mission with the other clan heads. She questions if she has returned from her mission. Ice Hand's revelation sends a shiver down Ichika's spine as she absorbs the gravity of the situation. The absence of not just her brother but all the clan heads trigger an unsettling realization. The reality of Ice Hand's revelation hits Ichika like a tidal wave, freezing her in a moment of disbelief. Her gaze lingers on Ice Hand, searching for any signs of deception, yet the gravity of the truth begins to anchor itself in her mind, creating a web of questions and uncertainties. In the heart of the Crimson Star Empire, a fortress stands as a formidable sentinel, its towering walls casting shadows that dance with the shifting light. The air carries a weight of history, whispered tales of battles and victories etched into the very stones that form the fortress. On a closer look, the fortress unfolds its secrets, proudly announcing itself as the headquarters of the fifth clan. Ichika's gaze fixates on the grand table where the clan head usually presides. Taking tentative steps forward, she places her hand on the vacant chair, a subtle sense of unease settling in. Leaning close, she voices the concern that echoes in her mind, her brother missing, and now her mother. The uncertainty hangs heavy in the air, casting a shadow over the once familiar surroundings. A girl casually sweeping the halls happens to catch a glimpse of activity inside the head's office. Pausing, she tilts her head, questioning whether the mysterious presence within is Ichika. A sudden call catches Ichika off guard, and when she turns, the familiarity of Miko's face registers. Ichika's expression softens, the surprise giving way to a subtle smile at the reassuring sight of a friend. Observing Ichika's distress, Miko gently leans her broom against the chair and approaches Ichika, urging her to cease the tears. With a comforting tone, Miko assures Ichika that both her mother and brother will return unharmed, emphasizing the unwavering strength of their clan. Ichika, tears still glistening in her eyes, responds to Miko's attempt at comfort by asserting that Miko cannot truly grasp the depth of her emotions. Despite not being her biological mother, the fifth clan head holds a special place in Ichika's heart, akin to a true mother. Ichika's conviction grows as she expresses her belief that something ominous has befallen the clan head. Miko, wielding her broomstick as a makeshift wand, gently taps Ichika on the head. The rhythmic gesture seems to carry a silent message of encouragement, a subtle reminder to stay strong amid uncertainty. Clutching her head in distress, Ichika winces as Miko patiently imparts the weight of being a clan head. Miko, with a solemn demeanor, elucidates that this position surpasses that of the hands, urging Ichika to place trust in the resilience of their legacy. Miko then questions Ichika's priorities. She points out that while Ichika is undeniably strong, focusing on training for the upcoming shinobi trials would be a wiser use of her time. Miko expresses concern that dwelling on her worries might lead Ichika to lag behind. Thankful for Miko's support, Ichika acknowledges her kind words with a warm smile. Yet, she gently corrects Miko, highlighting a subtle misunderstanding in her perspective. Ichika, with a confident demeanor, extends her hand, proposing a duel to Miko. The atmosphere is charged with anticipation as they stand on the brink of a challenging confrontation. Ichika locks eyes with Miko, her gaze unwavering as she asserts that falling behind is not in her nature. 
Miko raises an eyebrow, wondering if the sparring will adhere to the usual set of rules. Ichika nods in agreement, clarifying that the first to score three points will emerge victorious. Time seems to stand still as the two of them lock eyes, creating a moment of silent tension in the room. Out of the blue, a figure darts forward with sudden velocity, disrupting the equilibrium of the group. Surprisingly, it turns out to be Ichika who takes the bold step of launching an offensive, infusing the atmosphere with a newfound intensity. Demonstrating a blend of skill and agility, she employs a sequence of leg kicks on Miko, the rhythmic thuds echoing the unfolding confrontation. Yet, in a seemingly serpentine maneuver, Miko gracefully maneuvers around Ichika's leg, showcasing an unexpected agility. Caught off guard, Ichika is momentarily taken aback by this sudden and skillful counterattack. With a swift maneuver, Miko seizes control, firmly gripping Ichika by the legs, asserting dominance in the unfolding struggle. In a poised stance, Miko readies her free arm, ready to deliver a potent punch that adds a layer of intensity to the escalating confrontation. The forceful punch from Miko finds its mark, connecting squarely with Ichika's face. The impact resonates, adding a visceral intensity to the escalating conflict, with Ichika momentarily stunned by the powerful blow. At this defining moment, Miko successfully earns a point, solidifying her advantage in the ongoing confrontation. The recognition of this accomplishment intensifies the stakes of the battle. Descending to the floor, Ichika employs her hands for support, a strategic move that transforms her prone position into an advantage. Swiftly rotating her body, she executes a skillful kick aimed at Miko's head, introducing a dynamic twist to the evolving battle. Undeterred, Miko playfully taunts Ichika, suggesting that the potency of her kicks seems to be waning. In response, Ichika asserts that her kicks were intentionally restrained. Her declaration hints at a reserve of power yet to be unleashed, introducing an air of unpredictability. In a reversal of roles, Miko seizes the initiative, charging ahead with a newfound determination. The change in dynamics injects a fresh energy into the unfolding confrontation, as Miko becomes the driving force in this exchange. In a display of agility, Ichika deftly sidesteps Miko's punch, demonstrating a keen sense of anticipation and evasion. Unexpectedly, Ichika changes the tempo, opting for a playful strategy as she tickles Miko under her belly. In response to Ichika's unexpected tickle, Miko breaks into a smile, unable to contain the bubbling laughter that escapes. In a decisive moment, Ichika taps into her inner strength, channeling her tenchi energy with focused determination. Unleashing a series of calculated attacks, she claims another point for herself, the potency of her strikes adding a palpable intensity to the ongoing clash. As the ferocious assault concludes, Miko is propelled backward, sent flying by the sheer force of Ichika's relentless barrage. Feeling the ache from blocking numerous punches, Miko blows on her hands, attempting to soothe the discomfort lingering in her palms. In a moment of respite, she questions Ichika's intent, wondering aloud if the current display is a precursor to a more serious onslaught. Yet, in the midst of Miko's words, Ichika vanishes from her field of vision with an almost magical swiftness. The sudden disappearance adds an element of mystery to the ongoing confrontation, leaving Miko momentarily disoriented. Little does she know, Ichika has adeptly maneuvered and positioned herself behind Miko, ready to launch a surprise attack. Initiating a strategic move, Ichika unveils her secret technique, launching into a deadly onslaught by tickling Miko on both sides of her belly. Caught in the grip of laughter, Miko's voice rings out in a joyful outburst as the ticklish sensation takes hold. In that very moment, Ichika swiftly wraps her arms around Miko's arms, guiding them towards her neck in a strategic and controlled maneuver. The sudden and calculated action introduces a shift in the dynamic, as Ichika takes control of the confrontation. Asserting her dominance, Ichika, still holding Miko, tenderly pats her on the head. The victorious gesture accompanies Ichika's declaration that she has emerged as the winner of the spar. In response to Ichika's triumphant claim, Miko argues that her ticklishness was the deciding factor. Ichika, in a calculated response, asserts that she strategically used Miko's vulnerability to secure her win. Regret lingers in Miko's thoughts as she contemplates how revealing this weakness may have hindered her chance to be the top female recruit. Softly smiling, Ichika poses a reflective question, gently inquiring whether Miko envisions a future where she might trail behind. With a playful wink, Miko points at Ichika, 
playfully remarking that this is the familiar Ichika she recognizes. Despite the light-hearted exchange, Miko sternly demands Ichika's return to the training class, underscoring the imminent trials of the shinobi that require their dedicated training. With a warm smile, Ichika assures Miko that she will promptly return to the training class. The promise carries a sense of dedication, underscoring Ichika's commitment to her shinobi training. Encouragingly, Miko uplifts Ichika, expressing their shared goal of becoming the strongest female shinobis in the empire. However, Ichika, with a determined correction, asserts that their ambition transcends gender, aiming to be the strongest shinobis, period. Transitioning to a new setting, we find ourselves in the Castle of Traps, a place shrouded in mystery and danger. Under the gentle glow of moonlight, the Castle of Traps is bathed in an ethereal luminance. The traditional Japanese castle town, nestled in the night's embrace, comprises structures adorned with classic Japanese architecture, graceful curved roofs and sturdy wooden walls. Dominating the landscape is the Grand Castle, distinguished by a white tower and a striking black roof. Enveloped by a protective moat, the town is framed by silhouetted trees standing sentinel in the background. Within the castle, Yu and Shin propel themselves forward with unbridled speed, a dynamic duo slicing through the air with focused determination. Yu's urgent reminder hangs in the air as he glances at Shin, emphasizing the dwindling time. In response, Shin delves into a map, his analytical gaze deciphering the terrain. A confident belief forms within him, guiding his conviction that their destination lies to the left. With unwavering confidence, he asserts that the current turn marks the final stretch of their journey. Yu's revelation adds a layer of urgency to their pursuit as he discloses that this is their seventh venture into the intricate maze. The cumulative experience underscores the significance of their mission, to rescue a hostage within a confined time frame. Side by side, the two boys maintain their swift pace through the corridor, their determined strides resonating with purpose. The destination, where an apparent hostage awaits, propels them forward with a shared sense of urgency. Midway through their run, an unforeseen obstacle materializes, a concealed shinobi, positioned strategically for a surprise assault. Amidst the sprint, Yu's keen observation comes into play as he catches sight of something in his peripheral vision. Swift reflexes kick in, allowing him to narrowly evade the surprise attack. The adrenaline-fueled escape prompts a terrified shout, his fear palpable in the echoing corridor. Shin's disbelief is etched across his face as his mouth widens in astonishment. The realization hits hard, they find themselves facing the same shinobi once again, a perplexing recurrence on their seventh venture through the labyrinth. Yu channels his frustration into action, lunging forward with a determined punch aimed at the shinobi. Accompanying the strike is an emphatic declaration that he's adamant about not holding back. A realization dawns on Shin as he recalls the consequences of their prolonged battle with the shinobi during their previous encounter, resulting in the failure of the rescue mission. Fueled by determination, he swiftly reaches into his bag, resolving not to repeat the same mistake and ensuring a more focused approach this time. In a strategic move, Shin extracts a smoke bomb from his belongings, harboring the belief that this tactical tool will facilitate their escape from the persistent pursuit of the shinobi trailing them. Executing their plan with precision, Shin hurls the smoke bomb in the direction of the advancing shinobi. Simultaneously, he signals to Yu, urging him to swiftly move away from the impending smoke screen. The smoke bomb detonates with a burst of smoke, shrouding the corridor and swiftly creating a substantial gap between the shinobi and the duo. In a display of caution, Yu instinctively covers his mouth, demonstrating a conscientious effort to protect himself from inhaling any residual substances within the dissipating smoke. Unexpectedly, as Shin breathes in the aftermath of the smoke, a wave of drowsiness washes over him. Mid-sentence, his body succumbs to the effects, and he begins an uncontrolled descent toward the ground, grappling with the sudden loss of control over his movements. As the drowsiness claims Shin, he descends into a peaceful sleep. Miraculously, the shinobi also succumbs, crumpling to the ground in a deep slumber. Yu, taken aback, grasps the reality, it wasn't a smoke bomb but a cunningly concealed sleep bomb. Despite the unexpected turn of events, Yu swiftly grasps the reality that time continues to elapse, and his mission remains incomplete. The awareness of the ticking clock fuels a renewed sense of urgency, compelling him to refocus and press onward despite the unforeseen challenges. In the quietude, Yu directs a whispered message to the slumbering Shin, encouraging him to enjoy a restful sleep. 
The assurance of a return echoes in his words, a commitment to reunite after the successful completion of the mission, leaving Shin in a state of peaceful repose. Embarking on the descent, Yu navigates towards the lower floors, where the rooms are bathed in a radiant crimson glow. A diminutive form of Adam Hand materializes by Shin's side, a frown etched on her tiny features as she observes the consequences of Shin's choice during the test. Adam Hand surveys the situation with a hint of disappointment. The pronouncement is clear, Shin has fallen short in passing the test. The burden of success now squarely rests on Yu's shoulders. With unwavering resolve, Yu strides towards the door, a conviction in his heart that the hostage is concealed behind it. With a decisive turn, Yu opens the door to reveal a captive sight, a lady securely tied to a chair. The moment of revelation washes over him, a mixture of concern and relief settling in as he identifies the captive as the sought-after hostage. With careful hands, Yu starts to untie the hostage, who expresses the passage of time with a remark about hours spent in anticipation. Expressing regret for the prolonged wait, Yu extends an apology to the rescued hostage. With assurance in his voice, he asserts that she is now secure, seeking to alleviate any lingering apprehension from the ordeal. A transient change sweeps over the woman with crimson eyes as a sly smirk graces her features. In the blink of an eye, she delivers a forceful kick to Yu's face, launching him into an involuntary backward flight, a sudden turn of events amid the tension. In a state of bewilderment, Yu shifts his gaze back to the hostage, struggling to grasp the unfolding situation. The room carries an air of confusion as he attempts to make sense of the abrupt and perplexing turn of events. Seizing the opportunity, the previously captive hostage abruptly transforms into an assailant, poised to launch a series of strikes with her hand at the perplexed Yu. In the midst of the escalating conflict, just as the once hostage is about to make physical contact, a commanding voice reverberates, issuing a stern order to halt. The room falls into an uneasy stillness, the intervention introducing a momentary suspension of the impending clash. Perched on Yu's shoulder, Adam Hand, a small yet discernible presence, extends a round of applause for the once hostage's unexpected display of skill. With a nonchalant gesture, Adam dismisses her, casting a peculiar aura over the scene. In a show of courtesy, the individual who played the role of hostage executes a respectful bow before making her exit. In the aftermath of the intense test, Yu, perspiring, turns to Adam Hand with a query about his performance. Adam Hand, in response, denies outright success but acknowledges progress. From a state of complete inadequacy, Yu has elevated himself to a status just shy of being deemed utterly hopeless. In a moment of enlightenment, Adam Hand imparts a crucial lesson to Yu, emphasizing the mindset one should adopt when infiltrating enemy territory. The wisdom conveyed is clear, assume hostility from everyone, especially in a demon's lair. Adam Hand underscores the superior cunning of demons compared to humans and urges caution, advising never to approach any hostage unless their possession status is unequivocally certain. Yu, vexed and perplexed, starts absent-mindedly scratching his head, his frustration evident. In a burst of exclamation, he laments the recurring theme of perpetual mistakes in every mission, creating an air of persistent challenge surrounding their endeavors. With a light and agile jump, Adam Hand disengages from Yu's shoulder, elegantly bidding her farewell. Instructing Yu to find her upon Shin's awakening, she expresses her intention to tend to other matters. In the aftermath of the strenuous mission, Yu finds himself depleted and fatigued. In that state, Shin suddenly comes to his mind, wondering how he is doing. A solitary hour unfolds, marked by the subtle passage of time in the dimly lit castle of traps. In the aftermath of his slumber, Shin gradually rouses from his drowsy state, the transition marked by a subtle flutter of eyelids. The room, cloaked in the remnants of sleep, slowly comes into focus as awareness seeps back into his consciousness. With a puzzled gaze, Shin directs his attention towards you, curiosity etched across his features. He questions, seeking an explanation for the unfolded events. You unraveled the sequences of the events starting with the mishap with a sleep bomb instead of an intended smoke bomb. Contemplation marks Shin's expression as he ventures a guess, speculating that both he and you might have fallen short of passing the test. Yu, in agreement, acknowledges the failure of the mission, shouldering the responsibility and attributing the setback to his own actions. Taking charge of the situation, Yu proceeds to explain the next course of action now that Shin is awake. With a sense of curiosity, Shin raises a question regarding Adam Han's location. 
Yu, in response, ventures a guess, suggesting that she's likely stationed in her office. A burst of exclamation escapes Shin as he comprehends the need to relive the entire mission. In stark contrast, Yu bears the weight of disappointment, grappling with the sense of having let Adam Hand down once again. Unbeknownst to Yu and Shin, Adam Hand, observes their interaction from a vantage point, perched high above on a window. Her watchful eyes keenly track their movements and reactions. Curiosity evident in his expression, Shin questions the source of Yu's inner turmoil. In response, Yu, with a tinge of frustration, articulates the prevailing issue that they seem to be caught in a cycle of failure. He further delves into the retrospective, highlighting their track record of overcoming failed trainings in the past. However this time, it is different. The maze is not same every time they enter it and there is no consistent pattern they can count on. They never know what is around the corner and Yu is now at a loss for how he can pull this mission off. Shin, adopting a comforting tone, assures you not to be disheartened, emphasizing that the challenge they face is merely a test. His optimism shines through as he firmly believes in their eventual success. Despite Shin's encouragement, Yu remains enveloped in a lingering sense of discontent. Abruptly, Adam Hand undergoes a transformation, enlarging herself to stand before the young pair. She directs a question at Shin, pondering whether you should truly be disheartened by the day's outcomes. Yu upon seeing Adam Hand is taken aback as he thought that she had something else to do. Adam Hand proceeds to elaborate, emphasizing that in an actual scenario, their demise would have occurred four missions prior. Rather than pondering the reasons behind their mission failure, Shin opts to outright dismiss the notion. Apologies flow from Shin to Adam Hand, a genuine attempt to make amends evident in his tone as he reflects on the consequences of his decisions and actions. However, his attempt to speak is swiftly halted as she dismisses the need for Shin's apology. In a firm and cautionary tone, she declares the termination of his shinobi journey, citing the detrimental impact his current mindset could have on both his life and the team's safety. With a somber tone, she advises him to appreciate the timely intervention that spared him from potential consequences. Shin fights back tears, struggling to contain the emotion stirred by Adam Han's words. Meanwhile, Yu, utterly shocked, stands frozen, his eyes widening, and his mouth agape. The weight of Adam Han's decision hangs heavy in the air, leaving both young shinobi grappling with the unexpected turn of events. Adam Hand, with a stern expression, warns Shin that participating in the trials of the shinobi will likely lead to his demise. She expresses her astonishment at the connection between Ice Hand, her friend and colleague, and Shin as brothers. In a mix of concern and disappointment, she feels compelled to deliver this sobering advice as the best she can do for him. The impact of Adam Hand's words continues to reverberate within Shin, each one feeling like a sharp jab. Tears begin to gather in his eyes, unable to comprehend the gravity of Adam Hand's revelations. In a quick and decisive move, Shin makes his escape from the scene, leaving both Yu and Adam Hand in the wake of his departure. Sorrow reflects in Adam Hand's eyes as she observes Shin, understanding the difficulty of the tough call she had to make for his benefit. With a deep understanding of Shin's emotions, Yu feels the need to chase after his distressed friend. However, Adam Hand intercepts him, asking inquisitively about his intended destination. Feeling a surge of determination, Yu begins to elucidate that he and Shin embarked on this journey as a team, resolved to conclude it together, regardless of Adam Hand's involvement. Her gaze shifts upward to meet Yu's, and with unapologetic candor, she lays bare the unsettling reality that their journey is doomed unless they secure the much-needed guidance. In a heartfelt moment, Yu shares that his presence today is indebted to Shin, affirming his unwavering commitment to stand by him. He decisively states that if Shin is out, then so is he. Undaunted by her lack of acknowledgement, he confidently states that they will chart their own path to training, fueled by a determination to overcome any obstacle. Caught in a moment of profound silence, Adam Hand's gaze delves deep into the earnest eyes of Yu, a silent exchange that speaks volumes about their unspoken connection. In the quiet exchange of glances, Adam Hand discerns echoes of her younger self mirrored in the eyes of Yu, a profound connection that bridges the gap between mentor and pupil. As the narrative turns the pages of Adam Hand's training history, we witness the challenging days when her fellow shinobi mates, with skepticism writ large on their faces, dismissed the notion of her being a credible shinobi recruit. During the formative stages of Kyoko's evolution into Adam Hand, her sagacious sensei imparts a solemn reminder, 
elucidating that the moment she etches her name onto the tablet, the path she treads becomes an unalterable trajectory, a commitment to the arduous journey of the trials. Beneath the watchful eyes of a seasoned sensei, Kyoko finds herself under a penetrating evaluation. The wise mentor, voices skepticism about her survival prospects in the forthcoming trials. With genuine concern, he implores her to reflect on the greater collective, cautioning that inclusion in the team might inadvertently become a hindrance to their success. Unfazed by the shadows of skepticism, Kyoko stands her ground, her resolve unshaken. Defiantly, she declares that her destiny as a shinobi is not contingent upon the recognition of a hand. As the raindrops, driven by an unyielding force, embrace the torai in a watery embrace, the day of the shinobi trials takes on an additional layer of complexity. A solitary figure, bearing the marks of a fierce struggle, moves through the landscape with an unsettling demeanor. Clad in a cloak of crimson stains, the person limps forward, each step seemingly weighed down by the gravity of an untold ordeal. A lone shoe, left behind in the chaos, accentuates the surreal scene, inviting questions about the harrowing journey that led to this haunting presence. In the somber aftermath, her sensei's eyes mirror the disappointment that clings to the air, a tangible expression of the loss suffered in the crucible of the shinobi trials. A heavy sigh escapes him, carrying the burden of the unexpressed wish that the departed teammates had met their end swiftly and without agony. Kyoko claims that they all died in less than ten minutes. Some of them cried as they saw their guts spill on the floor. She then continues about how she came to the realization that it was actually her teammates that were holding her back and not the other way around. In the present, the air thickens with the weight of gravity hands in query as she pierces you with a scrutinizing gaze. Her question, like a probing needle, delves into the core of his determination. The room seems to hold its breath, awaiting Yu's response, as gravity hand challenges him on whether he will forge ahead with his training, undeterred even if Shin becomes a hindrance. Suddenly a voice from behind, shouts vehemently that he will not hold you back and that he shall not die in the trials. Unexpectedly, Shin reappears on the scene, his resurgence marked by a steadfast proclamation. His words carry the weight of a personal commitment, a resolute vow to succeed in the path of becoming a shinobi. There's a palpable sense of defiance against the skepticism of Adam Hand and the doubt that may linger between him and his brother. He acknowledges the breach of direct orders, yet stands firm, affirming that neither he nor you will retreat from their shared journey. In a touching display of unity, the duo clasp their hands together, fingers intertwining in a symbolic gesture of unwavering brotherhood. In a moment of realization, Yu discerns the unwavering determination in Shin's eyes, convinced that he won't succumb to despair. Shin, acknowledging the impact of Adam Han's words, humbly extends an apology, expressing how deeply her words had resonated with him. However, he follows it up with a declaration of newfound resilience, emphasizing that he has emerged from that shadow, stronger and more resolute than before. Adam Hand, her countenance darkened with concern, takes deliberate strides towards you and Shin. Each step seems to echo a silent gravity, hinting at the weight of the decisions that await. A wave of terror engulfs the duo, their minds racing with apprehensions as Adam Hand approaches. Thoughts flutter like caged birds, wondering if her demeanor hides a bizarre intention, perhaps a macabre plan to shrink their kidneys. At the decisive moment, she halts abruptly, a mere breath away from the two boys. The air hangs heavy with anticipation as her presence becomes an imposing force, casting a spell of uncertainty upon the duo. Her gaze unwavering, she issues a clear order, emphasizing the need for both of them to be present at the assembly point the following morning. Perplexed by the sudden shift in demeanor, the duo finds themselves caught in a whirlwind of confusion. Having been subjected to harsh words moments ago, the abrupt summons to the assembly hall leaves them standing there, dumbfounded and unsure of how to make sense of the conflicting signals. Observing Shin with a critical eye, Adam Hand, in a rare moment of approval, acknowledges that he shares a tenacious quality with Ice Hand, a refusal to quit. Her tone softens as she looks directly at Shin, offering him an unexpected lifeline by expressing her willingness to grant him one final opportunity. As the new day unfolds, the trio finds themselves within the formidable walls of a massive fortress crafted from unyielding concrete. The sheer size of the structure evokes a sense of both wonder and curiosity, as if they are about to embark on a journey through the labyrinthine corridors of an ancient stronghold, each passage holding the potential for discovery and challenges yet unknown. 
Their eyes wide with amazement, Shin and you stand before the majestic fortress, its colossal height dominating the landscape. The intricate details of the structure become more apparent as they study its towering form. With a solemn tone, Adam Hand imparts the gravity of the situation, revealing that this formidable fortress is the final battleground for those striving to earn the prestigious title of a hand. She emphasizes the castle's role as a testing ground for seasoned shinobi, and with a stern expression, she declares that this marks their last chance to prove themselves. The underlying warning is clear, failure within these formidable walls implies dying to the perilous challenges lurking within. A watchful sentinel stationed at the fortress entrance notices the approach of Adam Hand accompanied by the two young recruits. His stern voice reverberates at the castle's entrance as he seeks clarification on her desire to enter. Adam Hand, meeting his gaze with confidence, asserts her denial. The guardian, perplexed, directs his scrutiny toward the two youngsters by her side. He reminds her that the duo are obviously just trainees and the castle is only open to experienced shinobi. But before he could finish his sentence, Adam Hand takes a step closer, her demeanor radiating confidence. She gently places her hand on his belly. The guard, caught off guard by her unexpected gesture, looks down at her with a hint of curiosity. Within mere moments, he evaporates from the observable spectrum, his presence compressed into a fraction of its former self by the enigmatic forces commanded by Adam Hand. Turning her gaze back to the boys, she remarks that the place appears surprisingly unguarded. In shared astonishment, both lads nod their agreement, beads of perspiration forming on their foreheads in the wake of this false revelation. She proceeds to elucidate to the boys that the trial is deceptively straightforward. Within the castle's labyrinthine walls, a solitary exit awaits discovery, and their sole objective is to navigate the intricate maze without succumbing to peril. Without delay, the duo initiates a sequence of stretches, their muscles flexing and relaxing in preparation, signifying their determination to confront the looming challenges within the impregnable fortress. Side by side, they have traversed the doorway, entering a domain that unfolds on the other side, an uncharted territory awaiting their collective discovery, the barrier between familiarity and the unfamiliar now behind them. The moment they step inside, an all-encompassing darkness greets them, an obsidian void that obscures the contours of their new environment. Shin, breaking the hush, reveals the distinction between their current castle and the preceding one, emphasizing the threat capable of ending their lives. For the first time in their training journey, Yu grapples with a genuine sense of danger, a departure from the relative safety that has thus far accompanied their endeavors. With measured steps, they venture deeper into the castle's interior, and use observant eyes catch sight of a myriad of kanais protruding from the walls, a visual indicator of the perils that await. Understanding the unspoken warning, he internalizes the necessity of staying on guard as they navigate the castle's unpredictable terrain. A subtle twitch in Yu's brows betrays his unease as he discerns an unsettling stillness that blankets the surroundings, a quietude that resonates with an eerie calmness, amplifying the sense of foreboding. Without warning, the door behind them slams closed, producing a sharp and reverberating bang that pierces through the silence. Yu is gripped by a sudden wave of fear, his scream echoing at a heightened pitch, an expression of sheer terror that induces a startled reaction from Shin. Seeking to quell the rising panic, Shin, a blend of worry and frustration etched on his face, urges Yu to silence his vocalized fears, recognizing the importance of maintaining composure in their unpredictable environment. Injecting sarcasm into his words, Shin dryly notes that their current situation has attained a pinnacle of perfection, the closed door further restricting the already scarce illumination, plunging them into an intensified state of darkness. Yet, Shin's discerning eyes catch a glimpse of something noteworthy, prompting him to draw Yu's attention to the discovery. A soft radiance emanates from the fortress's corner, catching their attention, and upon closer inspection, the source takes the form of a torch, its gentle glow casting a warm illumination that beckons like a beckoning beacon. Grateful for the revelation of a light source, the boys, expressions marked by a sense of relief, commence jogging in the direction of the glowing torch. Yu, taking the lead in reaching the torch, extends his hand to grasp it, and with a firm pull, a subtle click resonates, unveiling an unforeseen mechanism. At that precise moment, a realization dawns on Yu, a gnawing awareness that he has made a significant error. Without warning, the floor beneath them parts ways, revealing a perilous descent into darkness where deadly pikes lie in wait, adding an element of horror to the unexpected revelation. 
To their dismay, the sight is compounded by the presence of yet another fallen shinobi within the ominous abyss. Yu, succumbing to the relentless force of gravity, begins a rapid descent towards the awaiting pikes below. Shock registers in Shin's widened eyes as he grasps the dire reality unfolding before him, a sudden realization propelling him into action, a palpable urgency to intervene before the impending danger becomes irreversible. In a decisive moment, Shin invokes the power of his Tenchi, a surge of mystical energy enveloping him as he taps into a force beyond the ordinary, a manifestation of his determination to alter the course of fate. With astonishing speed, Shin propels himself towards you in an instant, intercepting the plummeting figure with a precise and timely maneuver, a dynamic rescue that halts Yu's descent towards the perilous pikes. Together, they skillfully navigate the precarious circumstances, hurtling across the perilous gap and avoiding the menacing spikes of death. Casting a watchful look at you, Shin seeks assurance of his well-being following the close call. In a gesture of gratitude, Yu extends his blessings to Shin for the life-saving intervention. Seizing the opportunity, Shin underscores the importance of exercising extra caution as they navigate the intricate twists and turns of the labyrinth. Beads of sweat cascade down Yu's face as he nonchalantly remarks that he anticipated more formidable traps. In disbelief, Shin questions whether Yu is jesting, considering the imminent threat of impalement just seconds prior. Shin further points out the presence of a lifeless body, prompting Yu's admission that his earlier statement was merely a sarcastic quip. Undeterred by their recent encounter, the dynamic duo forges ahead in the mysterious labyrinth, their unity and resilience becoming evident with each step. Shin, taking the initiative, query about their chosen path within the complex castle. Yu, entrusted with the torch's glow, responds that any route is acceptable, stressing the critical need to refrain from touching anything. Opting for spontaneity, Yu arbitrarily chooses a set of stairs, their ascent into the unknown marked by uncertainty. Along the way, he notes the unpleasant odor permeating the surroundings, prompting Shin to attribute it to the neglected corpses lingering in the air. Their journey leads them to a lengthy hallway adorned with torches, casting a warm glow that extends seamlessly to the corridor's farthest reaches, creating an inviting pathway bathed in the comforting flicker of the illuminating flames. Abruptly, a substantial object plummets from above, crashing onto the upper level with a resounding thud that reverberates through the space below, creating a clamorous disturbance that echoes within the vicinity where they stand. In the aftermath of the unexpected sound, the duo, unsure of its origin, surveys their surroundings with a sense of bewilderment, their gaze sweeping across the surroundings in search of any visual cues or alterations that might provide insights into the cause of the disturbance. Out of nowhere, a gargantuan rock sphere sets itself into a formidable spin, charging towards them with unwavering momentum. Eyes widening in mutual terror, the duo stands frozen, confronted by the looming threat of the massive ball hurtling in their direction. Confronted by the enigma of the massive sphere, Shin articulates the shared confusion, querying the nature and origin of the gargantuan ball that has materialized before them. Undeterred by the looming threat, Yu, maintaining a composed demeanor, extracts two sheets of paper, dispatching them with precision toward the oncoming ball. The paper collides with the formidable object, sparking explosions upon impact, yet the display of pyrotechnics proves insufficient to impede or fracture the colossal mass. Yu, grappling with disbelief at the resilience of the circular object, finds himself astonished by its durability. In response, Shin, despite the less-than-brilliant nature of the notion, proposes a strategy involving the collective gathering of their Tenchi to deliver a combined punch, a potential solution born from desperation. Beads of sweat materialize on Yu's brow, a visible testament to the mounting pressure as he grapples with the realization that time is slipping away. The weight of the impending peril intensifies, knowing that if Shin's plan falters, their very survival hangs in the balance. Fueled by a sense of urgency, Yu vehemently asserts the need to explore alternative methods, unwilling to gamble their fate on a single, precarious strategy. With a sudden burst of urgency, Shin initiates a rapid sprint in the opposite direction, emphatically declaring that time is of the essence. Despite the urgency, Yu grasps the reality that the approaching ball is moving at an unrelenting speed, leaving little room for evasion. Yu's instincts kick in with a surge of certainty, a conviction that there must be a switch nearby. In the face of impending danger, his heightened intuition guides him, instilling a sense of assurance in the pursuit of a solution. 
A sudden revelation unfolds as you spots an unusual step on the floor, its appearance markedly different from the surrounding surfaces. The distinctiveness of this oddity captures his focus, presenting an unexpected element amidst the labyrinthine setting. With nothing left to wager but his own life, Yu takes a calculated risk and advances, placing his foot forward in a decisive move. As if guided by an unseen force, the floor yields to Yu's step, unveiling a concealed passage that swiftly engulfs him. The unexpected nature of this revelation intensifies the sense of immediacy as he descends into the newfound opening, disappearing from view. With a stroke of luck, the gargantuan ball grazes past you, its trajectory unhindered as he descends into an unseen tunnel below. With the distance between them widening, Shin raises his voice, a desperate reminder echoing through the air, emphasizing the critical imperative not to succumb to the perils that lurk below. Caught off guard, Yu experiences a moment of sheer astonishment, his senses overwhelmed as he continues to plummet down the tunnel. On the uppermost level, where the colossal ball maintains its relentless momentum, a resounding bang echoes as the door forcefully descends blocking the exit. The abrupt descent of the door brings Shin to an immediate halt in his tracks, freezing him in a moment of suspended motion. The realization hits Shin like a weight, sinking in as he comprehends the predicament of being trapped. The urgency takes hold, a palpable awareness that time is slipping away, leaving him with a sense of impending constraint. In a fleeting moment, a revelation strikes him as he notices a square hole within the circular object. The realization dawns upon Shin that precision in timing and a well-managed jump through the center of the hole might offer a slim chance of success. In response to the imminent challenge, Shin initiates the summoning of his Tenchi, drawing upon his inner reservoir of energy. In a display of fearless determination, Shin propels himself into the air, executing a single, powerful leap that sends him soaring directly into the path of the colossal ball. Opting for a head-first approach, Shin commits himself to a daring plunge, the sheer determination evident in his choice reflecting a mindset of embracing an all-or-nothing strategy. The act becomes a symbolic leap into the unknown, driven by a resolute desire for success. With a thunderous impact, the massive ball collides forcefully with the door that previously confined Shin, the clash of forces reverberating through the enclosed environment. The collision becomes a symbolic release, breaking the barrier that once held him captive. The fragments of the shattered wall succumb to the overwhelming force of the ball, cascading downward in a chaotic dance. Despite the ball's cessation, an unsettling void remains as it obscures Shin from view. The suspended moment creates an air of suspense, leaving uncertainty in its wake as to Shin's fate behind the stationary giant. Abruptly, his hand emerges from the jumble of rocks, a sudden revelation that cuts through the tension. Miraculously, he barely claws his way out, escaping the clutches of danger by the thinnest of margins. Agony etches across Shin's face, his eyes struggling to remain open against the waves of pain. The visible strain underscores the intensity of his suffering, a testament to the toll exacted by the recent ordeal. Amidst the haze, a mirage materializes before him, revealing the spectral form of his brother. With determination blazing in his eyes, he asserts to his brother that surrender is not an option he will readily embrace. Infused with determination, Shin strengthens his resolve, steadfast in the commitment that he and his companion, Yu, will emerge from the fortress unscathed. Meanwhile, on the lower floor of the labyrinth, through the tunnel's winding descent, Yu experiences the visceral pull of gravity, a downward spiral into the lower floor. Upon reaching the tunnel's end, Yu's descent concludes with a hard thud as he settles onto the ground. Awareness dawns on Yu as he finds himself returned to the initial starting point, a stroke of luck ensuring the absence of the perilous spike traps that previously adorned his path. At the room's farthest reach, Yu's attention is captured by an enigmatic object, prompting him to inquire about its identity. Straining his gaze, Yu discerns the existence of a peculiar item that bears a resemblance to a mirror, initiating a moment of pondering over its significance. Yu's eyes meet his own reflection within the mirror's confines, sparking a moment of speculation as he entertains the notion that this reflective object might harbor a hidden peril. A sudden impact jolts through Yu's being, his eyes widening in sheer shock as the unexpected blow resonates deep within him. As he gazes into the depths of his subconscious, Yu witnesses haunting visions of himself cradling the lifeless form of a fellow shinobi, the scene marred by the grim stain of blood. The fallen shinobi, being his friend Shin, a heartfelt cry escapes his lips, echoing through the corridors of his vision. In an instant, Yu jerks upward, 
beads of perspiration tracing down his face, evidence of the profound effect of the visions that had gripped him. Peering back at the mirror, you reflect on the nature of the vision that had unfolded, a perplexing mystery etched on his face. Turning his eyes upward to the higher tiers, he whispers a hopeful prayer, trusting that Shin maneuvers the twists and turns of the fortress without peril. The fortress, bathed in the gentle hues of dawn, bears witness to you and Shin, two days after they embarked on their perilous journey. The castle door swings open with a haunting creak, and Shin emerges, his eyes reflecting the lingering mysteries of the fortress. Yu follows, his arm tightly wound around Shin's shoulders, a subtle wince betraying the pain etched on his face. Yu, his stomach growling in protest, declares his hunger with a playful grin. Shin, nodding in agreement, confesses to losing track of time amidst the twists and turns of the labyrinth. Atom Hand, their revered sensei, manifests behind them, with a knowing gleam in her eyes as she addresses to them. Gracefully striding by, she commands them to prioritize their wounds, emphasizing the need for rest. Only after their recovery, she declares, will she delve into conversation. Yet, she turns her attention to you, inquiring about the revelations the mirror unfolded before him. Baffled, Shin directs an inquisitive glance at you, wondering about the peculiar mirror referenced by Adam Hand. With a thoughtful expression, you conveys that the mirror painted a deceptive picture, a fabrication that sought to misguide rather than reveal the truth. In a composed tone, Adam Hand remarks that clinging to childish fantasies won't sway the inevitable path fate has set. In the blink of an eye, Adam Hand vanishes, leaving you puzzled about their next move. Shin, however, gently reminds him of Adam Hand's directive to rest and await her decision. A smile creeps across Yu's face as he wholeheartedly accepts the notion of a break, firmly declaring his intentions to steer clear of that castle forever. Shin nods in understanding, and together, they make their way back to the comfort of their home. That is all for this season. Like, share and subscribe to be notified when the next season is released.